It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Richard Campbell is here. The government is suing to keep Microsoft from sneaking in uh, buying Activision. Okay. The EU says Google's ad model is just not right. Windows 11 version 22 H2 Moment 3 arrives and no one notices. Plus the big Xbox game sale and a whole lot more all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Richard Campbell and Paul Therott, episode 833, recorded Wednesday, June 14th, 2023, where games go to die. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Brooke Lennon. This year, give your dad the gift of a good night's sleep because dad deserves the best rest. And Brooklyn has dad's comfort covered with a lineup of home essentials made for relaxation. Visit brooklinen.com today and get $20 off plus free shipping on orders of $100 or more with the code WINDOWS. And by Duo. Duo protects against breaches with a leading access management suite, providing strong multi-layered defenses to only allow legitimate users in. For any organization concerned about being breached, any organization that needs a solution fast, Duo quickly enables strong security and improves user productivity. Visit cs.co slash twit today for a free trial. And by Cashfly. Cashfly delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and 30% faster than other major CDNs. Meet customer expectations 100% of the time. Learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Microsoft. And this is a big day for Microsoft News. Paul Therat is in the house, literally in his house. <laughs> uh, Therat.com is his blog and LeanPub.com is his publisher, where his books live. Uh, Mr. Run is Radio is also here, Richard Campbell. Happy Hello. National Bourbon Day, Richard. Thank you. I'm very excited. I got a good bourbon to talk about today. Perfect. So things are going to be fine. Are you in the Lake House or Coquitlam? We're in Coquitlam for right. now. Next week, we list the house for sale. What? Time to move out of the city. You moving to Mexico City, too? No, I think I'm going to visit there a fair bit. But yeah, uh, no, yeah. we think we're going to spend more time by the ocean. What? Uh, where is that? Uh, I mean, BC, of course, is, is a coastal uh, state, obviously, yeah, a province. We keep, all, we keep all our coast on the west side. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's about three uh, three hours north of here, where okay. I am right now, including a 45-minute ferry ride. Oh, wow. So it's an island. No, it's not, actually. It's connected to the mainland, but the highways don't go through because that's how severe the mountains are. So it's literally a strip of highway with a ferry at each end. Wow. Mm -hmm. That yes. sounds great. It is yeah. very pretty. Yeah. Funny. And you've been you, that great transition. You get on the ferry and now you're kind of in a different world. Yeah. And then we, uh, you know, we live by we the have, ocean. We have that here in Petaluma. When I used to work in San Francisco, I know I was home when I saw the cows in the fields. And yeah. I thought, yeah, this is home. So it's kind of agrarian out here. So oh, yeah. I know when I'm home here, when I see the right aid in the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so very hang, similar. Hang a left at the right aid. Yep. <laughs> you're there. You got it. Mm -hmm. So I was up uh, at 530. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, in the morning, sorry to say. Why? Why is that? I don't know. I couldn't sleep. I woke up. Ugh, it's the worst. It's the worst. And I thought, why am I lying staring at the ceiling? I should just get up. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I could do that. And then I and then if I didn't have to work, I would go back to bed after I would get up, have a cup of coffee, read the mm -hmm. paper, and then go back to bed. But I couldn't do that today. I had to come to work. <laughs> Darn it. Uh, so uh, if I get a little sleepy during this, uh, you'll sure. understand why. But I now did you'll note, know what I'm like every week. <laughs> a little slappy. <laughs> I did note uh, some couple of stories. You yeah. know, the uh, EU is suing Google to put it out of business. Okay. Love it. Yeah, Love it. Good for them. Good for them. I don't know how you break up an ad business. How does that even work? I, uh, you let's know. find out. All I have to say is let's find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you if, know? if the EU said, oh, Leo, uh, Twit can't sell ads anymore. Do something right. else. It'd sure. be like, what else? You know? Yeah. 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 I don't. Anyway, that's one story. But the other one was the FTC 
uh, asked the court for a uh, temporary restraining order. So you know what I love about this story, Leo? What's What do you love about this story, Paul? There was a news report about a week or two ago that claimed that Microsoft, according to sources at Microsoft, they were considering a, a, a cunning plan, as Baldrick would say, <laughs> to just consummate the acquisition, like to screw the just regulators. Do it. We're right. done. Just we're do doing it. this. Yeah. In other words, the I almost said the legal version of a flight risk, the antitrust <laughs> version of a flight risk, right? <laughs> Um, so I thought when I saw this FTC uh, lawsuit or the filing, I thought to myself, man, this is why they're doing it. But they just can't, they're not going to be able to say that. Right. They'll have some other justification. Well, I, I no, thought the, that, no, they that's said literally it. why. Yeah, they literally said it. Yeah, that's exactly why. They want to so forestall I, I, any. But right. So I'm confused. So if Microsoft went ahead, the mm -hmm. FTC could still say, yeah, unwind that deal. Right. I mean. That's right. But how hard is it to unwind a deal? We just talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. We just mentioned it. We didn't really talk about it. But like, how do you unwind something? Like, it, it gets to be difficult. You know, the other half of this is, you know, the CMA in the UK, of course, has blocked it as well. Um, there there have been reports that Microsoft has said, you know what, if the rest of the world okays this, we're just going to do it. Screw the UK. Mm. And you, you get into a weird kind of situation where these products get to be sold all over the world. What are you going to do? Not have Activision Blizzard and Microsoft products sold in the UK? I mean, it kind of it kind of pushes the point. Uh, that's, you know, yeah, that's sort of the that's the option there. You yeah. know, I I read the FTC play the other way around. This looks like a mechanism to force the FTC to make a decision. Like the reason to get the injunction is to expedite the case. So uh, that, by the way, that is the reason. And from Microsoft's perspective, and from Activision's perspective, this is the the good news here because Microsoft had uh, said that they would con or, um, finalize this acquisition by the end of their fiscal year, which is June 30th. It's mm -hmm. getting right down to the wire. Yeah, here we are two this, weeks out. The hearings for the FTC would have been in late August. Right. By moving this into a federal court, it can be expedited, which it is. Now the hearings are next week, yeah. which is before the end of Microsoft's fiscal year. There is actually a chance this deal could go through on time and before mm -hmm. the end of Microsoft's fiscal year, which yep. would avoid Microsoft having to pay a penalty of, I believe it was th $3 billion. Yeah, uh, which they would just hand in cash to Activision Blizzard if this acquisition did not go through. Um, so to me, that that is fascinating, um, and I I I I have to think this was Microsoft's cunning plan. This was the the idea was let's uh, let slip this idea that we're a flight risk, forcing them to seek an injunction, which pushes it into federal court, which expedites it, which puts this thing before the end of the fiscal year. I I yeah. I, I actually think this was Microsoft's plan. Not all along, but this this was Microsoft orchestrating what just happened, mm -hmm. which, you know, if true, good for them. And then uh, the next phase of this is like, well, you have to have the FTC on board. It's an American company, ultimately. You can call it multinational yeah. all you want, but the reality is the FTC could be leveling, uh, you know, leveling fines and so forth mm -hmm. nonstop, which I would wonder if the CMA on the UK might do but yeah. only if they actually break a rule of some kind. So just saying, okay, well, these products are not available in the UK, so it has no impact on UK customers. Well, there's also the, you know, Microsoft is appealing this UK decision, mm -hmm. and it, there's a possibility, I don't know how the UK legal system works, of course, but I assume it involves sticks and bones and stuff. But Guys in wigs, if I remember yeah. correctly. Powdered, yeah. powdered yeah. wigs, powdered wigs. Important. yeah. yeah. Uh, but whatever it is, I mean, you know, it, there's a possibility they could win on appeal there as well. I The... <laughs> um, I, the the problem with antitrust, and I was talking to Brad about this this morning, is that antitrust is, is not only can't keep up with changes in technology, which is just true of law in general, right? But it's also just deliberately vague, and that can be really problematic. And in this case, you know, the UK has said, or the CMA has said, Microsoft has a dominant position in this market that we call cloud game, you know, game cloud streaming or whatever you want to call it, game streaming. And Okay. Microsoft's argument is, well, there's this market called gaming and game streaming is like this thin little sliver of a line of usage that has nothing to do with what most people do. And we don't really see it ever being a huge chunk of it. So when you think about it in the context of gaming, there are companies that are dominant in gaming, mm -hmm. Apple and Mike, uh, Google on mobile, uh, Sony and consoles, you know, whatever, however you want to define that market. We're not dominant anywhere. And if we succeed in getting this acquisition we become bigger it's better for us it's better for our customers but we don't ever we don't end still up still don't dominate we They're don't dominate anything things. that matters right so yeah. yeah we'll dominate this cloud gaming thing but there's nothing going on in cloud gaming yeah, so both guys will be really excited about that yeah exactly so 
uh, it it, it kind of hinges on semantics or definitions or however you want to, you know, market definitions, whatever you want to say. So um, we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. But this was, um, this was an interesting little overtime, you know, gambit on Microsoft's part, I think that. Uh, Did they pull this off. too late? Like, shouldn't they have done this a month ago? The FTC? Yeah. Microsoft and the, well, Microsoft and forcing the FTC sense. But did the I, judge, I, by the way, give them the injunction? The expedited yes, hearing for next yep. week. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yep. But he did the he did the two things side by side. Okay, there's mm -hmm. an injunction, but that puts an impairment on the company, so we should accelerate the company's That's right. That's uh, right. injunctive relief. Oh good. Because right. otherwise it would have been August when the uh, exactly. administrative judge looked at there was also looked at um, this. I, <laughs> I love the language of it too. It was like um, we're preventing Microsoft and acquisition from finalizing this acquisition that they have planned. But we're also, just to be clear, there's no other version of it that we're going to accept either. You can't come to some other deal that's a, like a lesser act. In other words, like Microsoft or Activision could say, we're going to sell Call of Duty and we're going to sell the rest of it to Microsoft. What what they're saying is, no, 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 no. We, we get that you have all these little ideas about how you can kind of get around what we're trying to prevent. We're not going to allow any of it. But now it's gonna. Now they'll be able to present their case in court, and I think yeah. this is where things get really interesting because I think Microsoft has a wonderful case to present. Yeah, and, but it is a three billion dollar case. If yes, anything it, other than a win happens here, three, there's three only billion there's, dollars flows. There's no the chance to not pay the the breakup yeah. fee essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. unless they're willing to negotiate an extension in terms. But I can't imagine why Bobby Kotick would. It's three billion bucks. Well, I, because I think for him personally, uh, he has got this. It's not golden; it's a platinum par par parachute that he's mm -hmm. going to have. Like and, iridium, uh, like it's yeah, yeah, whatever the yeah, like uh, unobtainium a uh, par, you know, a parachute. Yeah. Um, uh, that might be why. I mean, three billion dollars is three billion dollars, but they, what they want to do is sell the company for sixty nine billion dollars. So yeah, yeah, and, maybe, and he'll do very well with that. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he gets. I I wonder if the breakup fee again is a forcing function to the courts. Right. Right. It's right. like this is you your inability to execute to make a decision here is risking a three comma number. Yeah. But there's yeah. always a breakup fee. I mean, that's part of all of these deals ha have breakup yeah. fees. Here's, because here's the thing. I, I it's I usually not three when, billion, but it's sometimes a, a lot, you know, mm. but just looking at the deal in general, I, 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 I feel there is no logical argument to be made against Microsoft acquiring this company. Now, yeah, I agree. I, know there are, I agree. I, know, I, yeah. I think anyone who knows what they're talking about would, of course, of course, they would think that. But if you disagree, let's just... If Which you're the FTC there, you're like, you're, apparently does. Well, it, and Sony literally said that the CEO of Sony, whatever the American, the Sony, whatever the company's called, the Sony America, basically, literally wrote to Activision going back and forth and said outright, look, we don't care. We just don't want this acquisition to happen. It's literally that dumb. So there are people out in the world who just, I, we don't like Microsoft. We don't like a, this idea of this giant company owning more of some market. It doesn't really matter. Like, I'm not thinking about it clearly, maybe, but it doesn't matter. I just don't like bigger, big becoming bigger. You know, I go, fine. But the thing is, the the thing you can't really argue against is, let's pretend game streaming is a market. Let's It is, okay, it's a market. It's going to be a market. It's going to be the biggest thing in the world. What Microsoft is offering is the same thing they offer with Call of Duty, which is we'll put our stuff everywhere. We're not going to restrict access to games. So if Sony, actually they do, it's in the news later. Sony has is testing a game streaming service for PS5. Uh, they've been talking about this for a long time. This is going to happen. There are other game streaming services that Microsoft has already had deals with, with regards to different things related to Xbox, Call of Duty, Activision, etc. Um, we'll, we'll just offer you that same deal, 10 years. We'll give you 10 years. Everything we do, we'll make sure it goes on your platform too. This answers any com actual complaint. So if the if the UK CMA is serious about this, that cloud gaming is the issue, and if the FTC, which is frankly colluding with the CMA, it is also making the same argument, well, that just throws that all away. So if you can present this in court and say, we are literally meeting every issue they have, I don't see how this doesn't go through. Mm-hmm. And your only argument, because I just don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it I makes, get it, but it makes me sad. It makes me crazy, <laughs> you know? So anyway, we'll see what happens, but it, it's I, dumb. I'm that excited it had to that it's coming. It's coming to the head by the end of the month. Like, yeah, yeah. Watch this space because yep. it's going to come up next week and it's going to come up the week after that. <laughs> yeah, sure is. Two days of hearings next week. So we'll see. Yeah. I, um, I just, it, it, 
it's sad that it came down to this. Um, and I think a lot of people and myself included have thought like, why does Microsoft even bother at this point? Like there's so many, he so much headway here. Like why are they, they're getting so much pushback. And, it's really um, sets a bad precedent to walk away on this too. Yeah. Th that it, this deal's dying, not because it's not for the greater good or that right. it causes any specific harms. We just don't like it. And that's, yeah. that's terrible. Well, precedent. It, it, I, listen, I love that government has woken up to the notion that big tech is bad. Thank yeah. you. Where were years you too a decade late. ago? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 10 years too late. Thank you. But 10 years. So, but you're going to survey the world and it, this is what you're going to go after? Yeah. Really? But it's I, not going to get past a judge. I'm sorry. Because the judges. What do you mean? I, you, the FTC is not going to succeed because the judge is going to say exactly what you just said. What is the harm? Where is the yeah, harm? That's their harm. job. And I think that in failing the FTC proving harm. Oh, I'm sorry. You're agreeing with me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm agreeing, agreeing with you. I'm, like, no, I'm saying that you could. <laughs> yeah. you, that was a straw man argument you were making. Sorry. and I was just punching mm -hmm. it with oh, you. Oh, I got you. I'm sorry. 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 <laughs> Together. Like, we were. God, Leo. I thought I just made a compelling. <laughs> no, case. no, you did. Um, it, it, the, but the court. So, this is the whole. Why it's bizarre. Because yeah. of course, it's going to sleep last night. I'm, I'm no, I it didn't. I'm like... so tired. <laughs> <laughs> you seem a little off. I woke up no, and I um... read this story and I couldn't go back to sleep. I knew that <laughs> I would. Well, be the EU's not to change gears here, but the EU Google thing. Yeah. Like, at a time when I would argue that online advertising is the most messed up. The, the arguably the weakest as we you know forces are pressing against it in so many different ways. Now you're coming for them. I know. Like it, I know. I, a little I, late. I mean, this is this is this makes me crazy because my business can't succeed being supported by ads. It can't. Mm -hmm. If that's the if that's all we get, I have to go out of business. It, it, you know, Google it's funny that you say that. Market. It's the same thing for us, and it's because yes, of Google it and yep. Facebook. Yep. Because you can't compete against somebody who collects every ounce of data right. <laughs> about the people who are no, it's, looking it's, at the it's, ads. It's Advertisers want that, and yep. and and you can't do it. Uh, this you, is why you, you could need, arguably you do it better than we can, but you we need can't competition do it all. in this market. You need competition in apps. It's the same thing. You mm -hmm. just you, when you, you funnel everything to through one or two companies, this is what happens. Yeah, you know. But this I think happens. that maybe it would be more appropriate for the uh, EU, and I hope our federal regulators as well, to go after data brokers, yeah. uh, the people who are you know collecting information and selling it on to anybody. I mean, you go after TikTok. You, well, even if you kill is, TikTok, the Chinese government just goes to the data brokers and gets the same thing. Yeah, it's you're talking story. about like basically like privacy laws, and this is yeah. but that's another area where. But that's what they don't the like US. about online advertising, yeah. right? That yeah. you have to invade people's privacy to do so it. So <laughs> we all know this, right? The central stupidity of advertising and tracking people online is that it has been proven time and again that personalized ads, meaning ads derived from tracking someone online, are not more effective than just random ads. And in fact, I, I, I mean, we all know this. Everyone knows this. How weird is it when you had a conversation with your spouse or a friend or you Google something or you watch a show on Netflix and then this stuff appears in search results everywhere right. or it just appears, I'm sorry, in ads. Or you everywhere. make the mistake of visiting a site once and then it's yes. every other ad. Like, it's like seriously. Yeah. And, and like that, that just, I think uh, that just turns into a trust problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want people to trust this stuff, stop tracking them <laughs> you know um, one, one of my favorite stop. my my favorite moves i did a while ago was sending them I, I bought a product and then i started getting ads from it right and then i messaged and says i will return this product yeah, unless this these freaking ads go away this is pointless exactly <laughs> yeah i bought the sneaker stop, stop showing it. me sneaker <laughs> ads that's the height of stupidity yeah i always see this is a million years ago but i bought my mother this might be even 20 years ago. It was a long time ago. I bought my mother a book on Amazon. So it was some book my mother would like. And then I was just recommended. Well, now books. we know what you like. Well, <laughs> menopause or whatever. You know, and it's like, guys, you got to think a little bit here. Like this is. You it, buy one just, bottle of Viagra and yeah, for yeah, the yeah, less. Exactly. Rest it of your was life. a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, I. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the stories that we're covering, we'll be covering uh, later today. On um, uh, this week in Google, is uh, the fact that the <laughs> the U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies. It's from Wired magazine. The U.S. is openly stockpiling dirt on all its citizens. Jeez. A newly declassified report from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. 
mm-hmm. reveals the federal government is the what a huge customer of these data brokers. And even though it's illegal, they're buying it uh, on U.S. citizens. Yeah, and it's illegal. It's it's explicitly illegal, but they're doing it. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, instead of going after Microsoft Activision or yeah, going I, after I Google for their is ad it actually model, illegal to buy it or is it illegal to use it? Oh, we what can buy this, it. We just can't look this, at this, it. That's this, it. This is the, the Amsterdam <laughs> doctrine. You can you can have marijuana. You just can't grow it. <laughs> Where do we get it from? We're not we're, we're not addressing it. <laughs> you know. Uh, it's it, it's incredibly infuriating. Yeah, oh, it's but instead they're gonna they're gonna ban TikTok because China. Well, it's easy to go after China right now, and I'm not saying yeah. China shouldn't be gone after. Right, but there are it's if cheap. They, if this it's is cheap. your concern, yeah. there are other concerns. Exactly. Well, so seriously, like. I, <laughs> like there's all this uh, surveillance or whatever that China's doing, and you're the thing you're worried about is TikTok. Yeah, yeah. TikTok. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. crazy. Well, and by the way, the Chinese government can do exactly what our government does and buy information about you and me and everybody else. Sure. And all that information is being collected. Now, the funny thing is, I don't think Google or Facebook right. lets that information out because that's their secret sauce. That's what they sell advertising against. So they don't just go to data brokers and say, hey, let me tell you everything there is to know about Paul Therat. They keep that closely Protected. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, uh, we don't know obviously how the, what the information looks like that they give to data brokers. We know where the information comes from, right? Because we have whatever behaviors and usage we have online. We use Google Maps. We use Gmail. We use. Yeah, but Google, I'm telling you, Google doesn't want someone else to know that information because right. it helps them sell ads. That's their secret sauce. Same with Facebook. Well, I would, I, I would. There argue are other in Google's case. Every it's, app it's, you put on your phone is what's selling them yeah, to it data brokers. It doesn't matter. It's not if Google. Someone knows that Google's collecting information about where I went to eat because I was traveling with Google Maps, right? Like, like it's that's fine. Like, but even Google the, Maps, they're not selling that. I don't think. I've never seen well, any I, evidence that I they are. I mean, effectively, I really they are when, in the sense that when you the your ability to define a demographic for running an ad on Google yeah. is based on yes, that. they're selling it in that way. They're yeah. saying, look at Richard. If you would like to have reach more targeted advertising, men in their fifties in Dedham, sure. Massachusetts, we can hey, sell hey, you hey, them. Hey, but hey. we don't. But we don't tell you who that. We don't give you their names. As long as I don't have to advertise to Upper Mukunji, I'm good. <laughs> However, lower, lower, the, lower. you know, three quarters of the apps you're running are doing all that and gathering yeah, it and yeah. selling. That's where the data brokers get it. It's not from Google and Facebook because they don't want to give that information away. That's uh, that's their that's what they sell. You know, in effect, right. against. So I think it's is a very misguided all around. It's and by the way. I played mm-hmm. Diablo 4 for most of the weekend. Listen, yep. <laughs> that's why you're tired. And that's an excellent game. <laughs> it's a Good. little grim. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. I'm a Di- Oh, I'm a Diablo fan. I played 1, 2 and 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh So that's a that's a Blizzard game, meaning it's uh-huh. an Activision Blizzard game, uh-huh. meaning uh-huh. Soon, coming soon on Game Pass if everything goes right. Am I ta- am I Yeah. <laughs> am I right? Am I right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah, if 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 the evil courts allow it. Right. Well, we're going to hope that the courts uh, are not evil and are not in our thinking and are listening. Yeah, I can't imagine the courts I letting this go Confronted through. with this argument, I yeah. don't see how any court doesn't no. say. I. The this courts are going to rule against the FTC. A ludicrous no waste of yes. our time. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, as, and this whole activity has been a forcing function. Oh, in your ISP. I mentioned that Sony, so, the country of Sony, okay, this deal. <laughs> the country of Sony. <laughs> that would, that, if I was Brad Smith, I, that would be my only thing. I'd be like, Sony approved it, and then he sits down. It's like, do you have anything else to say? No. <laughs> approved. You're, you're protecting a in Japanese Sony country. Company. No one has any idea why. <laughs> Even Japan doesn't understand it. <laughs> okay, the country of Sony approved it. The I mean, country I'm of making, Sony. I'm just making a note <laughs> for the brief when I do the amicus. Uh, <laughs> Dudes. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> the country of Sony approved it. Just a <laughs> small town, McCungie. <laughs> to my plain spoken mind. Uh, all right. 
Uh, I've completely lost track of where we Shit. are. Should we do some windows? No, no, no. You should stop, and I will. Uh, I will do an ad, and then okay, and then you should do then some. Then we windows. can do some windows. If we've got <laughs> ads, we're gonna do them. But the I good news care. is we're not gonna collect any personal information right. about you. Right. Uh, late, not we, targeted. Interesting. No, leave that to your ISP. Yeah, that's the problem. You said in a very interesting thing, Paul. That. Uh, mm. It's not ads. You can't be ad supported anymore. You have to have, you have premium. I mean, you can be if you don't want to make any money. Yeah. It's like going to art school. I mean, you could do it. It barely covers <laughs> costs. It's the same thing for us. And those, yeah. and the, that revenue is dwindling. Uh, that's why yeah. we have the club, right? Right. That's why we have a premium program. Though. Yeah. Yep. And uh, that's why I'm always telling people you should join the club because it really is what's going to keep us around uh, in the long term. If without it, I don't, you know... Spotify's, uh, you know, firing people right and left from their podcast division. Um, right. NPR fired 30% of its staff because a podcast revenue was down so dramatically. Right. If you're not a member of Club Twit, you can hear Paul's hands on Windows, Micah's hands on Macintosh, the Untitled Linux show, Scott Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks. Uh, all of these are in the club only. You get access to the Discord and you get ad free versions of all the shows. And that means no trackers. We don't, you know, you're just pure, unadulterated content. <laughs> and all of that, seven wow. bucks a month, I think it's the best deal in uh, going. Uh, all you got to do is go to twit.tv slash club twit, sign up for a month, sign up for a year, get your family plan, get the whole family involved. Corporate memberships also available. Twit.tv slash club twit. Now you can talk about Windows. So I'll just tell you right now, it's raining really hard here. So if I disappear, it's because... Mm -hmm. Storm. The lightning has arrived. <laughs> you should do what they do uh, in those German towns on the Rhine. Yeah. You should put a little mark on the wall. The river oh. rose this high in 1624. <laughs> right. Put that there because, uh, you know, future uh, Mukunjites. If it comes up to where I am, we're really in trouble because we're on the second floor. <laughs> yeah. Is it Mukunjians or Mukunjites? Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to go with Mukunjians. Oh, boy. <laughs> I think there might be a tree coming right through my apartment. Anyway. Oh, oh no. It'll be okay. Oh, no. Be okay. Now, have you heard of the concept of hunger stones, which is the opposite? Oh, no. What's a like hunger stone? Right is that like stone so, soup? Yeah, a hunger stone are carvings in stones that are only exposed when the river levels are yeah. catastrophically oh. low. Oh. That caught because of drought and some oh. crops are going to fail. But yeah. literally, they're carved in stone if you see this weep. Yeah, you're in trouble. We didn't see those. Last time this happened, we died. We were on a river saying. cruise, and if it had been that low, the boat would be right. like this. <laughs> uh, actually, but you know, let me do one more thing, because I want to tell you, I did tell you about my uh, lousy night's sleep last night. Mm -hmm. It was not due to the sheets. I just want to say, our show today okay. brought to you by Brooke Linen. Oh, these sheets are so nice. We have um, Brooke Linen's best-selling the Lux Satin Sheets. <gasps> so smooth and soft, luxurious finish. When you get in bed, it's one of those, it's those sheets, you know, when you go to a hotel and you and the bed is freshly made and you get under there and you go, oh, that's, oh, it's what you, that's what I got. Oh, it's so nice. Brooke Linen. I think they should license the Beastie Boys. No sleep till Brooke Linen. But that's just me. Brooklyn, and just that's because they come from Brooklyn. It was a it was a couple, Rich and Vicky, back in the 2014. They started Brooklyn with the idea that we can get we can sell really beautiful linens online, hotel quality luxury bedding delivered right to your door at a much more affordable price. Everything you need to upgrade your home with quality products and curated designs. You and your guests will be swooning. <laughs> swooning. Brooklyn, and, although I'm not putting the good stuff in the guest room, I can tell you that right now. Brooklyn has been making dream spaces a reality for almost a decade. They're the obvious choice of making your house a home. What a great gift for a housewarming, a newlywed couple. Uh, even, I have to say, even Father's Day. Dad doesn't want to tie. Dad wants to be able to crawl, climb into bed and go, ah, that's what dad wants. I can tell you. If you're unsure where to start, Brooklinen's bundles will help save you time and money. That's what we got. We got the uh, 
the the Lux Sateen Sheet Bundle. So it comes with the sheets, the top and the bottom, pillowcases, four pillowcases, and a beautiful slate gray duvet that's just classy as heck. Love it. But they have them for bedroom. They have them for bathroom. They have them for both. Uh, they also have an organic collection now if you're looking for a natural option. Brooklinen.com. You'll see all the stuff. They have towels. I, in fact, this morning, I dried myself with my beautiful Brooklyn towel. Lisa got them in red, cherry red. <laughs> she loves red. But they have all colors. <laughs> I, like the, I like the red. Wire Cutter and Good Housekeeping awarded Brooklyn for their outstanding betting. Over 100,000 five-star customer reviews. One reviewer said... I seem to get to that wonderful sleeping temperature very quickly and stay there throughout the night versus my older cotton sheet sets. Another said, best sheets in the world like butter. It is. They are. It's like butter without the grease. It's really, they're, oh, you feel so good. The best gift for dad this Father's Day. Brooklyn and uses only the highest quality materials for all their products. Long staple cotton. Everything they create is built to last Sheets, pillows, towels, bath rugs, robes. Oh, a robe for dad. See, wouldn't that be nice? Dad would love that. What are you waiting for? Now's the time. Shop in store or online. Brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N, brooklinen.com. Gift yourself for your loved ones. The rest they deserve. Visit brooklinen.com today. You'll get $20 off plus free shipping on orders of $100 or more when the offer code WINDOWS. So when you're in the shopping cart, use the offer code WINDOWS. You can remember that, right? And that helps us, too, because they see that. And they go, oh, those Windows people love linens. Brooklinen.com, offer code WINDOWS. For yourself, for dad, for grad, for new brides, it's a great gift. $20 off. You don't have to tell them that part. Plus free shipping. No sleep till Brooklinen. Brooklinen.com. We thank him so much for supporting. Windows Weekly. Uh, on National Bourbon Day, how's the rain? I gave, I decided to do another commercial. Right, so I noticed you were weird thing. concerned. Yes, yeah. I said my wife because she has a plant hanging out of a tree. Actually, it was kind of weird, but it was like it was sideways <laughs> at one point. But now <laughs> I can still hear the thunder. But now with the sun is out, it's just been like oh. weird. Going like sun, dark sun. Do you have a storm cellar? Uh, no, you can't go down into the storm <laughs> cellar. No. Oh man, you're gonna regret that. He's gonna ride this out. Yeah. So now, Richard, now, yeah, let's talk about Windows. If, what, if you want to, if you released an update to Windows and nobody noticed, <laughs> did that happen? <laughs> it did happen. Moment three is and, here. Uh, it is here. And obviously, if you install the preview update, as we talked a few weeks ago, you're not going to notice anything because the the non-preview version of this update just adds the stuff that wasn't in that, which is just basically bug fixes and security fixes. So kind of a non-event. But even the people who did not install this in preview are noticing different things, right? I've heard from multiple people on this. Uh, some people have installed it on different PCs. They get some features on one, but not on the other. And this is that controlled feature rollout thing that we were talking about so far as just randomly deploying stuff and uh, i've seen this on my own computers um as well it's weird so you know we talked about access keys remember leo did the the demo where you could see what that looked like that's one that some people are not seeing uh, most people but not all are actually i don't know, think of it the alt uh, tab change where uh, not all tabs from uh the microsoft edge browser will appear in alt tab it's been reduced down to 20 tabs at most. Not everyone's seeing that. <laughs> you know, this is stuff like that. So it's Microsoft. This is my entertaining life uh, late, of late. Um, I don't know what to tell you. So that's what's happening. <sighs> and yeah. at least nobody's screaming. Like, <laughs> has it well, yeah. So, uh, th well, that's, and, okay, that's interesting because that's, the, I would say, the other issue with moment three, which is that as moments go, fairly unmomentous <laughs> you know it's uh a non-momentous i guess um well and, really, and, and you're up against the issue here which is nobody was looking for these changes right and so your best you can hope is they don't notice that you made them right well because the, that's the, the other possibility is that yeah. you've now moved their cheese and they're angry if that's the plan it's working great because yeah, they're uh, killing it <laughs> they're, they're nailing it it's uh 
So, yeah. Anyway, that <laughs> happened on Tuesday. Um, <sighs> it's weird. I don't know. I, I spent some time updating the book for this. I don't even know why I do these things anymore. It's just pointless. <laughs> um, You're on the treadmill now. Yeah, I am. On the, yeah, there's a... Uh, one of the other changes, let me see if it's on this computer, is... Um, yeah, actually it is. So there's a new interface for pinning widgets. If you care about that kind of thing, that's new. Uh, it's really not a lot. We're running out of stuff. Uh, halftime adjustments. I don't know. There's really not much to say. So that's where we're at. One could argue we've been running out of stuff for some years now. <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, this app isolation thing is incredibly important. Yes, I, 100%. Like, yeah. Of all of the things, I mean, I've read all the things, Paul. I do read yep. your stuff. I am okay, a I'm, premium I'm, member. I, I apologize. <laughs> and, and most of it, I am happy to mock. <laughs> this is actually important. It like, is. It yeah. genuinely is important. It has been a problem for a long time. This is the... Yes. This is the 10x solution. This is yes. the 10x no, actually, solution. Like they, this is right. what we've been trying to do all along. I wish to God Microsoft would say it just the way you just said it, because I, I yes, 100 percent. You know, you have to kind of know the history, know what you're talking about and can draw these kind of connections. And I just wish Microsoft would do it, because when you think back to Windows 10x and this idea of this alternate version of Windows that was going to have a simpler new UI and a container based architecture where all Win32 apps would run in, in a single container and be isolated from the rest of the system. And then uh, UWP, or what we now call like a Windows uh, app SDK apps, will run in their own containers, right, with their own sandboxing, right, which is the model today. You sort of applaud this and you think this is, you know, this is a good idea. But they canceled Windows 10X, um, and part of the reason was this compatibility issue that they had yep. with this container system. Everybody has an app they must run yeah. that won't, yep. it won't work with, and it's so, never the same app. You know, you were, uh, this was a long time ago, but back when Windows 10S was a thing, back when S mode was a thing, the argument I made, and I made this directly to Terry Myerson, by the way, but the, the argument I made about this was, guys, you're doing this all wrong. It should not be a mode. What you should be able to do is have what we now, like a, um, like a, a an allow list or a block list mm -hmm. for these apps, right? Are you whitelisting or are you blacklisting? Yeah, That's you can question. you can block everything by default. That's fine, but let me get Chrome in there because Chrome is the one app I rely on that I need to be allowed to run free for whatever you know. I just I need it. I it doesn't work in S mode. I need this app, whatever it is. And your and only option kind of, is to simply shut off S mode. Yeah, and I, to me that was just it was too black and white. I don't un, I I never understood why. They architected it that way. I think that's the reason it failed. This was Windows RT. You've got this thing that like, back in Windows 8 timeframe, you've got this thing that looks just like Windows 8. And then you go to the web and you're like, I'm going to download iTunes at the time or Chrome or whatever it is. And that thing will not install. And nope, what nope, the heck nope. is this thing that looks like Windows that doesn't run Windows apps? Mm -hmm. So it seemed like this container system for Windows 10X could have solved the problem. Um, performance issues, obviously, but also uh, they, actually the reason they canceled it was compatibility issues. So how is this new thing different? There's a new technology they announced in a build called Win32 App Isolation. It does use containers, by the way, app containers. Um, Microsoft technology, right? Nice. Um, it works on an app-by-app -app basis. It's exactly what I've been asking for, right? So uh, it's not something you can as an end user, because it's brand new, right? So we, we're, right now we're at the point where we're asking developers to take a look at this and see if they can put their apps in this container and make them more secure, make them better citizens on the computer. I, I expect um, IT folks to jump on this. I do too. I, I I literally went in that direction in the article I wrote. I was like looking ahead, thinking about what they did with S mode and Windows RT and, and everything else. Like what's the logical end game here? And the logical end game is this lists of apps you can use or not use, right? That mm -hmm. we're going to lock down the entire system, but we're going to allow some small list of Win32 apps that are not contained because we, they're vital to the business or whatever it is. Like yep. th there's no way that this is not where this is going. No, and, I, and I've I've seen companies do machine isolation for this, where it's like those insecure apps only run on these machines. Air um, gaps, or, or, or they're or they're living in Azure Virtual Desktop for the same right. reason. That's right. And what you're now offering here is that solution, but back onto the desktop. Yeah, yeah. You know? This is um, this has been a long time coming. I mean, yeah, there's no doubt about it. But Even, yeah, it's it's gonna it's a common it'll be a combination of of dev changes and sysadmin changes yes. to apply yes. this to a machine that's essentially a lockdown machine that yep. we we have a, a set of apps that are allowed to run and yes we have that cranky old app running but we've gone through this, this the app is, containerization right. so, process for it 
uh, geez, I got to think when did they add this? Yeah, Windows Vista, they added this thing called user account control. Mm -hmm, and the idea see. behind user account control was like, look, we made this, we made a little campaign to try to get people to lump, run as limited users. No one's doing it. They're all running as admin. Okay, what what can we do? And you basically put up like that middle brake light on a car. It's like a little, just, a, just think about what you're doing here for a second. Like you as the user have permissions over everything on this computer, but the thing you're about to do could be dangerous. Just think about it for a second, right? Yeah. And whether or not UAC it didn't work impacted, because it yeah, popped yeah. constantly. <laughs> you're right. You, okay. You learn to just say, "What do I have to say to make you go away?" Yes, but the the but what it, it never solved it was mm -hmm. this notion of when you install an app, whatever it is, Chrome. I'll keep using Chrome as the example. Chrome runs under your permission level. Chrome mm -hmm. can do whatever it wants. Chrome could be malicious, but the bigger problem is that Chrome could be compromised and a malicious actor could act on your behalf on your system using your permissions to do nasty things to your documents, to your private data, to whatever else. And uh, this this is this is the solution to that other half of the equation, which is uh, the user is the weakest link for sure. <laughs> but by extension, the user's permissions <laughs> spread over the computer are also a very weak link, maybe sure. literally the weakest link. Um, and this is what we're trying to address. So. I, listen, this is this been twenty years of work that went into this. That we used to have, um, your what was it called? The uh, MDOP, the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack had app virtualization. Had I can't forget the names. The MedV and AppV, I think, were the two products. And you know, one of the neat things you could do was like vir run a virtual application on a physical computer without having a virtual machine that was the entire desktop. That kind of thing. That's one virtualization is kind of one way. I think this containerized approach is maybe the more modern slash i'll call it better way um where it is locally installed it's a native app it's on your computer but we just you know and by the way there are going to be prompts there's going to be uic type stuff this is the thing you're going to have an app that's going to want to access your documents it's going to want to access the camera i don't know what that looks like yet it's probably going to look like a uac prompt right we're going to get it they are going to be a little more annoying um but this is this is the right approach. And and to Richard's point, start with developers, go to IT. But the end game is going to be some version of Windows where this thing out of the box is going to be secure. It's going to be a little more annoying. But hopefully, but I think the, the hope or the goal is by this point, maybe we've mostly moved on to more modern apps that are sandboxed already. So you don't have to think about this. And it will make the older apps that we sort of still rely on, the offices of the world, the Chrome, you know, the, well, web browsers, unfortunately. Um a little more annoying and maybe we will move on to a more modern architecture for apps uh, and those things start to go away so anyway it's a good thing it's in public preview today it's really kind of i guess technically just aimed at developers really i think they want to get developers going yeah i i don't know the devs are going to grab onto this so much as as yeah, um sysadmins will and then they'll go to the dev saying i can't make this work help me right. does the developer have to support it explicitly or? yeah it's something oh. you can add to an app uh, yeah That's i mean it really, not... it's about a, it, essentially the containerization is about a manifest what rights do you yeah. need okay. what what ability to access oh that makes sense because you, you have to get entitlements to use those right. things yeah 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 and and so what well, the bigger thing you hear is some of those entitlements are so comprehensive that they're they're insecure right. and so like pushing the you're not really sandbox that stuff off well, I, I need like, to be able I, to write to ring zero and uh, the hard drive yeah, yeah, well, thank I you don't, I, see, I, don't, I don't think most app developers actually think that way but i i, I think lazy ones do is, that's the problem that's a lazy approach yeah. right yeah well I, I but microsoft has been kind of pushing developers in this direction for a well, while so it's kind of also is about, good at lying to software right like this right. was chris jackson's old shtick we did a bunch of shows on this the shimming effect where it's yeah. like oh i want to i want to write into system 32 and you go sure yeah. no problem and it actually <laughs> right. it in the yeah in so in this case you're virtualizing data, right? the yeah. file system <laughs> or you virtualize the registry and yeah. you're like oh yeah i know just do whatever you want yeah, like, whatever you want it's writing to a fake version of the registry. Yeah. And the, yeah, so this is basically about packaging. Like you said, there's a manifest file that kind of mm -hmm. explains what it can and cannot do. And we'll see. I, I, the goal, this needs to be as easy as possible. I haven't yeah. looked into it. There's a GitHub uh, repository you can go check out to see how to do this. I mean, dude, um, it'd be nice if this is easy, but yeah. it's even, even more important than that. The bottom line is the thing that you hit on, which is I have an app that's badly behaved, right? The yeah. one that, that everybody depends yep. on. And I am willing to mm -hmm. spend a whole day trying right. to figure out how that's to right. build a wrapper around thing. this yes, thing. Exactly right. Because yep. it's that important.
So I think it's going to happen. I, 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 I've always saw, I, as soon as I saw this thing and went, the win 10X I, as a logical extension of the work that came before it and as this mm-hmm. is as well, I think, you know, yes, they're on the right path. I think there, there's an answer here. Yeah. Um, the wind, windows 10 S thing or the SMO thing was not the answer. And it was so easily expressed. You can't just lock down the whole system. Like that's when, you know, you can't ship something. You can't, I mean, they did actually, but you, when you ship something that looks exactly like windows, but doesn't run all windows apps, you know, people tend not to like that thing. <laughs> they get a little grumpy. Yeah. So it was fun that in Esmo they they were like, oh, you know, we fixed it. You can you can get out of it. And it's like, yeah, but you get completely out of it. There are actual real world reasons why you don't want background apps running all the time. You don't want the Win32 apps to have access to the system all the time, uh, whatever it might be. There were good things about it. But, uh, you know, there had to be a, con- a kind of a common sense um, yeah. middle ground. Well, and that all or nothing thing meant it was always nothing. That's right. Yeah, that's what happens. That's what happens. Everyone, every people would try it and then they would fail. Yeah. And they would say, screw it. I'm just going to go back. To, I'm just yeah. going to run. I, and my security doesn't matter if I can't conduct business. Right. End right. of story. Yeah. So that was the real. Anyway, it's happening. So that's neat. Awesome. Yeah, to, me, I, to me, this is kind of like the biggest. I mean, well, the Activision Blizzard thing's pretty big, but this is this is big. This is big. Yeah. No, it's it's a really important thing in windows, something that's been coming for forever and we've been hoping for, for a long time. And so yep. the, the idea that it's in the insiders bill just speaks to, Holy man, we may, we may actually get this dealt with before win 32 becomes irrelevant. Yeah. I don't remember the timing on windows 10 X exactly, but let's say they canceled it probably in, Oh boy. What are we looking at? 2020, 20, 2018, something like that. And, you know, the UI pops up in Windows 11. You're like, oh, cool. Okay. That was a cool idea. I get that. May of 21. May of 20. Oh, that, geez, okay. And, um, but you're like, but what about that other thing? Because the UIs are fun. We, they're easy to see. You can, you can talk about it. It's neat. But this kind of fundamental architectural change was so important. And I was so excited about it. Yeah. And it just kind of dropped off the earth. And so. Yeah. I mean, the uh, good, the good, the honest truth there is like the code never goes away. Yeah. So that, you know, it just goes back into the lab and they munge on it for longer. Like, right. I, I don't know that they could have gone any faster if they just said it's got to be app containers. Right. But right. maybe a little, but there were definitely some other attempts there. You know, I, I always wonder what the minimum uptake would have had to have been to keep it going. Yeah. Like if 10% of enterprises had been able to use 10X, would they have kept it alive? Well, because thing- I think it was like 1%. <laughs> yeah. So, ten, I mean, 10X, I, he almost, it almost had to be its own OS because they couldn't just do it to Windows. Yeah. Whereas with this case, you can say, well, yeah, the Windows is unchanged. Now we're just going to change apps mm-hmm. and that's fine. We, we've we've lived in a world in Windows now where we've actually had app sandboxing since Windows 8, right? So mm-hmm. type certain types of apps, right? Yep. And Microsoft has allowed packaging of desktop apps to be sold or downloaded through the store since Windows 10. Mm-hmm. So we, we've really been kind of taking all the steps we need to get um, developers used to it. And then users don't really have to get, well, they will have to when they start seeing prompts, but it should be basically seamless. You're still going to install the app. There's not going to be, the UI doesn't change or anything, um, but you may but see the, occasional. But he, you, you see the trepidation. It's like there's a group of folks that have to walk around the Gordidian knot that is Win32 going, <laughs> sure, sure. you really want to take this sucker on? Like, are, yeah. are you sure? Like, it is the giant <laughs> bugbear in the room. Right. Yep. Yeah. And and literally decades of essential software yep. built in it. Um, I mean, the, I'm looking at my taskbar right now, and there is not a, a single. Let me think about that. An app that has any bearing on like UWP at all in there. Yep. Now there are modern apps like Teams that are based on web technologies. Mm-hmm. A Notion, I'm sure, is a web app. Um, but uh, but the rest of it. You know, uh, well, Visual Studio Code is a web app, mm-hmm. but the rest of this is desktop stuff, right? Word, Brave, uh, Photoshop, Paint, Notepad, yeah. all that stuff. And a lot of those apps have modernized. Yes. You know, oh, yeah. Mod- yeah, you know, absolutely. We, yep. But there's plenty of out there that, that haven't. I mean, I think one of the greatest sinners of all time is AutoCAD. AutoCAD still tries to write to INI files for goodness sakes, right? Like that's awesome. And I mean, the number of <laughs> internal shims at Microsoft inside of Windows that say if AutoCAD is not trivial, but they're utterly dominant in their industry. There is no alternatives. They the ecosystem is so massive that right. it is what it is. And they don't have to get better. Hmm. Well, 
they're going to be forced. Well, <laughs> we're going mean, to extrude these apps through a. This is this is going to be the. Like, and I have game. I have friends who are the sysadmins for large yeah. organizations that use a huge amount of AutoCAD. Like this is a technology that they will literally pull one of their people on and say, you know what you're doing this week, you're figuring this out because if this actually can address this problem. The amount of challenges they have around, around security, you know, they're af they're afraid of software updates. They're afraid of all of those things because of their privilege escalation risks. Right. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's exciting. Just, yeah, it really is. That's why I buried it in the middle of the notes. <laughs> That's nothing like pick, pick privilege like escalation risk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. No, but yeah. I, I, uh, I, there's a, most people can't see the notes, but there's a section that's just like Windows Insider Program. It's just preview stuff. So I put it at the top of that because. It's not really an insider program thing per se, but it is more interesting and important mm -hmm. than the other stuff. Although I will say today's dev channel build is interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to highlight that part of it. Um, you know, usually we debate the fact that the search box is curved instead of square. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. true. <laughs> it's nice to have something a little more meaty. I agree. I agree. Yeah. 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 I, I I'm going to regret this sidetrack. I know you know this, Richard, because you talked to Sno uh, Jeffrey Snover. But um, mm. I was uh, in writing about PowerShell recently. I came across this uh, quote from him where he was talking about why this thing was needed. PowerShell being the um, uh, the command line uh, scripting environment in Windows that he wrote .NET based, right, object oriented, et cetera, et cetera. Because obviously they looked at Unix shells, right. Mm -hmm. And they would have used Bash or something like Bash. That that was what they thought they were going to do. And what they found out is that it doesn't work in Windows because Bash and those shells and all of the commands that are in them that, that you pipe things through are all based on this notion of text-based files. Uh, Unix is designed with text-based text everywhere. files. That's yeah. the point. Windows is not. It used to yeah. be. That was the any file. That's why I thought of it. Um, but they use the registry now and they use, uh, they're basically, uh, I'll call them like, um, not digital files. They're all digital files, but they're binary. data files. They're binary yeah. files. Thank you. Um, and that's why uh, that's why Windows had to use a different kind of scripting environment. And the thing it created was incredibly elegant and is excellent yes. and is in many ways superior to what you see on Unix. Well, and conceals you from that complexity. Yeah. I would also add the other element was Active Directory, which just yes, yes. same thing. The privileges models were so intensely complicated. Right. Where, this is where Unix was wonderfully binary elegant. thing. Yes, right. Exactly. Yeah. So I, anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting because I think a lot of people today still would look at Windows and be like, how come they don't use the, uh, like, just use a Unix shell? Like, why wouldn't they just do yeah. that? And it's like, it doesn't work. Yeah. If you want to use Unix shell, we've got, you know, WSL for you, the Windows Subsystem for Linux. Yeah. So you can go do that. It won't help you in the Windows area, but at least you'll be happy. And that's interesting. But I do have to say uh, the fact that the search bar has a different curve in the window and in the taskbar to me is still kind of a bigger deal. But I'm not saying it isn't dumb, <laughs> but I'm not entirely sure that it's important. <laughs> What are you laughing at, Paul? <laughs> One man's junk, Leo. It's another man's treasure. That's right. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You, you know, I, I wear, I'm afraid I wear more tinfoil than you do. And like, <laughs> you know, there's some stuff I'm worried about. And sure. the curve of that thing is not one of them. Well, you just don't have as good ADHD as I do. That's um, <laughs> that might be why. Anywho, okay, so in addition to Win32 app isolation, we, there were, have been a couple of uh, Windows Insider program builds over the past week. One was last week, one was today. The one today is much more interesting. I have been waiting, as I do every year, for the dev channel to kick in with a, a build that has a bunch of new features in it, right? Um, when we, As we kind of head toward the next version of Windows, this has to happen at some point, right? And... Uh, in the world of today where we have these moment updates so you don't get the big bang effect anymore this might be as big as they get but today's dev build was pretty big and you should take a look at it um the big one is something that people who do like smart pens and you know surface tablets and that kind of thing are going to wonder why this didn't happen 10 years ago but they're actually uh improving windows ink uh or modernizing it i guess we could call mm. it so that you can drink drink <laughs> I also didn't sleep a lot last night, Leo. Uh, <laughs> so that you can ink directly into any edit field in Windows, right? And so, which is you, better than you, drinking directly. So, I think you chose the right phrase. <laughs> yes, ink um, directly. Ink directly. <laughs> so, if you follow the history of the tablet PC, you may know that back in the day, uh, in literally the day 2002, you would click in an edit box somewhere in Windows, and a um, a keyboard, what do you call it? The uh, tip, the tablet input panel would appear at the bottom of the screen. 
and you could write in it. And what you wrote would then go into that edit box, right? It would recognize the handwriting, put it in the way it had to go in digitally. Uh, in the second version of the tablet PC operating system, they made the tip a floating thing that would appear near that edit box. So if you clicked in there, it would appear right under it, right? So it's kind of context aware or whatever. Um, but the update we're getting now, which I guess will be in 23H2, will be the ability, you just, you're handwriting right on the window, right? And uh, it's hard to tell from the screenshot, uh, but I believe what happens is it goes in with your handwriting because it's terrible looking. And then when you finish writing it, it goes into the text box as text and you go from there, right? So if you want the example they're using is you're searching in the search box that's in the settings app, you write something in there with your pen, back off, it, it you know, it uh, recognizes your text, puts it in as text, and then the search goes. So uh, it only took 20 years, but um, it's happening. So that's cool, right? Love it. Anybody? Nobody? Okay. But me, yeah, again, both guys using their pens are really excited. <laughs> I <don't, I> <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh Lord! All right, all right, hold on, hold on. I'll, hold I'll, get, on. I'll get you. There's more. There's more. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one. Um, there's some folder option changes in File Explorer. Not a big deal. Focus session widget. Not a big deal. Um, if you've been waiting for features like never combine in the taskbar, which only went out to some people last in the last build, or the ability to tear tabs off of uh, File Explorer and have it open a new window, or merge tabs by dragging them in, that's there for everybody. But the other big one is uh, this goofy thing that's been in Windows 11 since day one that hasn't made a lot of sense to people. There's an app in there called Chat, and it's on your uh, taskbar by default. It's purple. looks like the Teams logo a little bit. It is a front end to a consumer version of Teams that is not the Teams that you and I use every day. It's like a, a home version of Teams. Nobody uses this thing. It's been a huge problem. It's the replacement for Skype, basically, although they haven't replaced Skype, which is also part of the problem. Uh, it doesn't integrate with Skype directly on and on and go. But anyway, the, the the hidden dumbness of this is that this the team's home client that's in Windows 11 is actually pretty fantastic. And it doesn't matter because nobody uses it, right? So starting, I will assume, well, I shouldn't assume this, but sometime in the future, because it's in the dev channel now, they're actually going to rename chat to Windows Teams free. So they have a new brand. Uh, they're going to just acknowledge this is, in fact, Windows Teams. It's the thing. It runs its startup. It's on your taskbar by default. Like I said, the U, the default UI is actually really neat because it lets you start a meeting or a uh, like a chat session or a video call just right off the window. Like it's not the full Teams experience. It's like this little customized thing. So I don't know if that's changing, but they are in fact renaming this thing and they're kind of admitting, okay, it's Teams, just kidding. And um, so we'll see what that looks like. That's kind of, uh, that to me is kind of interesting. I feel like they yeah. made a- I just wish it wouldn't use the same name. I, you know, like let it be a different product because it's yeah. separate install. It's a yeah. separate update. Yeah. All you're doing is confusing people. There's no reason it couldn't. Why didn't you just call it chat? Well, yeah. So the other, uh, speaking of confusing, if you use uh, Teams on mobile, you can actually have home and business in the same app and you can switch between those profiles. It's a little awkward. I kind of wish there was a view where you could kind of have both at the same time. I don't like going in and out of that. It's like if you have different profiles in, uh, you know, Facebook or Instagram or something. It's and, really and yet I'd argue in favor if it was the same app, but there was clearly like a home mode and a work mode. Yeah. That I find okay. that more acceptable than two pieces of software, both named Teams. One of them isn't Teams. Yeah, right. And I... I kind of hope and wish and expect even that that's what but this was skype and skype for business right skype for business not being skype and probably not good for your business right like those were bad <laughs> names well it's like if you and if you sign into windows with a work or school account you have got your OneDrive for business icon in the desktop you can also sign into your OneDrive consumer account and then you have yeah. two cloud icons in the tray and you get two instances of OneDrive, and you and, don't know uh, which is which and well, one's blue and one's gray. It's yeah. super obvious. No, um, <laughs> well, and, so. it, and that's uh, my M9 cleanly built M365 machine. There's exactly that. There's the business OneDrive account and the personal right. OneDrive account. That's right. Yeah. So, anyway, and, it, and you is, recognize these are the features that Microsoft employees themselves use. That's, that's why they work fairly that's well. Right. Whereas you think, okay, but why don't you just have one OneDrive icon, one OneDrive node in X File Explorer, and then it could say work and home. And yeah. you just got to go, from, I don't know why. Well, now you're just talking crazy talk, Mr. Thurman. Know, I'm sorry. I just, you know, this is two different teams, so it has to be two different icons. Yep. I know. Sorry. Um, last week, there was a beta channel build. We don't have to talk about too much. There's not too much there, but uh, there's a new narrative voices. Uh, I should say new natural sounding narrative voices uh, for Chinese and Spanish, both Spain and Mexico. And then there's some uh, a toggle that will, um, if you have a cellular connection in your laptop, it will help 
kick in when your Wi-Fi connectivity is poor, which is, I'm sure, a feature that was already in Windows, so I'm confused what that even means. But anyway, that's what happens there. Um, and here's the next huge announcement, because this is also <laughs> humongous. This, no, this is also big. And we were, I, this is what we were talking about, Leo, when you came in. Um, AMD at CES announced that they were adding an AI engine, as they call it, an MPU, to their chipsets. Ah. And uh, the first of those is now shipping, and it's actually a product that's out in the world today. So uh, this, I believe, is called the Ryzen Pro 7040 series. Uh, it's in some Lenovo and HP PCs right now. It is that MPU thing that we've been talking about. It is the first x86 NPU. It, so you can enable such thing. Well, well, not such things. You can enable the one thing, <laughs> which is called uh, Windows Studio Effects, which is those kind of, um, you know, blur your background type of webcam nonsense that everyone does. But requires an MPU, so that's available. Uh, but the next step, of course, is Copilot. So uh, for people who want to use Copilot to its fullest extent, uh, I'm not saying this is going to be required, but I am saying it's going to work a lot better. So um, this will be kind of interesting. And they have, they kind of have this, or um, not AMD, no, it was AMD, I'm sorry, talked about a multi-year plan where um, the the rationale for needing this will grow and grow and grow. Oh, yeah. Right, today, Today, it's literally like, well, you can have like a, you know, blur your background in your uh, Probably in the next, webcam. in a year, everything will have yeah. a, an NPU or some sort of uh, yep. AI processing chip. Always, and always Meteor Lake is, is coming out this fall from Meteor Intel. Lake, that's, yeah. right. that's right. Are these NPUs big enough for some of these bigger models? Like if Copilot's really going to run on the local workstation, right. is that GPT-3? Because last time I looked, that model was a terabyte. Right, right. So it does and it, but it doesn't have to. Nobody knows how big the G doesn't have to load the whole terabyte, does it? I mean, uh, it says that's how models work, man. If you don't have the whole weighted uh, model, how do you do the execution on it? Huh. I think this is the point of the hybrid um, AI thing that Microsoft and its partners yeah. are talking about, where parts of it are in the cloud, parts of it are local, and yeah, Google's talked a lot about shrinking the models so that they can fit yeah. on the phone and that kind of thing. Well, and, it, and this, what I was looking for in the early conversations around GPT-4 a couple of years ago, they were saying, hey, we're going to go, three is as big as you want to go, we're going to work on a smaller model. Now, they ended up not doing that. <laughs> they made arguably one of the largest things that's ever been made and is now costing a fortune and more and more that's being surfaced. Right. Um, because as long as something's growing like that, it still hasn't been figured out. Right the, sizing is a measure of, yeah, hey, I've right. got the shape of this and now mm -hmm. I can tighten it up. I'm able to use stable diffusion models, which are 1.6 gigs on my iPhone, which has yeah, right. less RAM, obviously. So they must, must be have paging a, a, it somehow. A Pro Max, though, because you need a bigger iPhone. No, no, no. It works. <laughs> yeah, Pro Max. <laughs> I do have a Pro Max. I do. But, uh, well, how much RAM does it have, though? Not a, not a right. gig and a half. Actually, iPhones do not have a lot of RAM. No. That's, they're that's notorious the for being iPhones. Yeah. played on RAM. Yep. So I'm thinking they're paging it, right? They must be able to do the work. Or maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe there's, you can use an index or something. I mean, is it, do you really have to have the entire model in RAM? Well, I mean, it, it's interesting to think about how they might break those things out. Are they doing word pre-processing on the right. machine and actually right. doing the back end of the cloud? Right. You know, th they have talked about MPUs being able to run stable diffusion, but the full model of stable diffusion is like eight gigs. Which huh, is, actually, that's way too much for a phone, but that's totally PCable. Oh, it's that's easy. What, that's PC. what uh, yeah. Qualcomm showed off at Build was stable diffusion running on a yeah. Qualcomm based P or a um, yeah. Snapdragon based PC. But I don't know if it was the huh. phone. I, I don't know that we fully got our head around how this is going to go about, but I think we, talking to hardware folks that I know when they're talking about these MPUs, they're saying, where do we draw the line while you guys keep building bigger models that are destroying? Do they have, anyway, does the right? NPU have dedicated memory? Or is it using uh, RAM? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think it dep the answer I, is, it, it depends. depends. Right. Because I just think so of the NPU as kind of an MMX yeah. on steroids. Yeah. is like the, I think so. some That's sort of I think of you know, well. yep. special processing. I've never heard design. any conversation about MPUs having dedicated RAM. Mm -hmm. I mean, GPUs uh, do, right? GPUs do, yeah. Um, yeah. And MPU is, in some respects, a faster GPU. Right. Or, or well, purpose-built GPU. Specialized. Purpose, yeah. 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 It, they're basically VLSI. They're FPGAs. Uh, they're um, they're programmable. I don't, I don't know if an MPU. Programmable gate arrays. I mean, effectively, they all are. Yeah. Specialized in different things. Specialized, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the RAM in GPUs is also specialized because it's meant for ray tracing. Right. So it needs to do rapid updates of simultaneous numbers. So right. actually, the organization of the RAM is different because right. so many different scalar processes have to write to it simultaneously. Right. And that's why they ended up putting RAM there. 
I don't think the machine learning models have that issue. And so regular RAM should work for them. Although there's an argument at some point for a cache. Yep. And remember, the apples have this unified memory architecture, and right. there so is no GPU. That helps. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. That's interesting. Well, all the I, all the RAM is shared with the GPU, the NPU. And, I just, and the I, CPU. I, my, I mean, without knowing the full details of, I think it's fair to say that even these first gen NPUs, as we'll call them, will offer advantages over just a CPU GPU setup. But that as we go forward in time, they will advance to the point where maybe they will be dedicated. What it doesn't really matter what the details are, but they will get they will get better over time, of course. I and mean, it's just sort of a it's so and the same it's the so same thing easy. happened. The first generation GPUs were on board. Yeah. Right. They getting to and then they were they the dedicated cards and the dedicated architecture changed over time. Right. right? I mean, even Intel stuck with their onboard GP stuff for a long time. Right. So it it's interesting. You know, we're just in the early days. It, it'll iterate as the workloads iterate. Right. Hmm. Exciting. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, as much as we, you know, the fun part is we talked about weeks ago. Hey, I'm going to hold out for an MPU and a machine. Now that it's actually getting closer, I'm like, but what MPU? And what do I want from that MPU? Right, right. And, and you know, you start to get into the harder problem of how is this going to make a difference? Like, what's the benefit? They're going to, you know, just in the same way that people would compare ATI and, um, a, well, and ATI, NVIDIA, and Radeon and NVIDIA mm -hmm. graphics cards, whatever some of, you know, this one's best for this game and this one's best for this game. Yeah. There will probably be temporarily, it's like the, uh, you know, this website runs best on Netscape Navigator. No, and, and like it, this, the test will be, can I unplug best. the network card from this machine? Can I take this machine offline and still do right. this stuff? Cause I'm not, I'm not expecting any copilot to work offline. It just doesn't seem like a thing. Uh, no, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Hmm. Just right. Realistically, knowing the the well, shape I of these know. models. So, I, I, so one of the interesting things about Microsoft's Copilot approach is that it kind of takes the internet out of it, depending on the use case. In other words, you're working a, 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 against maybe organizational data in the case of Microsoft 365. Uh, but then, but then you have to be on M365 because the language model is living up there as well. Yeah, no, no, I, uh, no, I'm sorry, but I was going down. So, but if you go down to uh, like Windows Copilot, you you know, this stuff where it's like, how do I turn on dark mode to be more productive? That stuff's just local. So there, there are going to be parts of it that run locally, right? I mean, those parts. I am not convinced. <laughs> okay. But where does my Spotify playlist yeah. come from? Uh, I, sus yeah, I suspect it's going to be a trip to the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I clearly have some, I have some. I have some reading also, to do this weekend. I got to find out how this stuff how works. Microsoft likes to make money today, and it involves a trip to the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> to the cloud, <laughs> wasn't that? Yes, that was the slogan. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> to the cloud. My whole desk flipped over and to the cloud, and then from the cloud to be able to go the other way too. <laughs> Back and forth, <laughs> and yeah. But that is their Boy. that's their business model. I understand that. Yep, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how it ought to be. Uh, what else do you have before? We, I want to take a break before the Microsoft yeah. 365 segment. Okay. All right. So there's another interesting one. Now, this is only in preview. So what's well, in the insider preview, but the version of the Windows subsystem for Android WSA that's available, I think, across all of the channels in the Windows Insider program has now gotten uh, Windows Linux file sharing capabilities, right? Excellent. Windows, sorry, Android. I don't know why I, really, I always get confused the two subsystems. So the idea there is you're running an app on an, an Android app, like a photo sharing app or something or whatever it might be. And you want it to, you know, you want to save a file. It can save it to a, a Windows location, right? You, you know, you're using photos in this app, you're using photos in your PC. They should be the same the same thing. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, that's one of those really obvious capabilities. Um, and it's finally happening. So that will probably be live in stable I don't know, sometime this summer, I would think, uh, kind of the ability to go back and forth between the, um, Android, uh, I keep saying Android, the, no, oh, Andrew's correct. I'm sorry. The Android mm -hmm. file system <laughs> and the windows file system. Good. And you can drag and drop between them and file explorer and all that stuff. So good. That's kind of cool. Um, uh, my pedantic little monkey brain uh, got hung up on this one. I saw the announcement that Microsoft was bringing voice chat to Bing chat on the desktop. And of course, the first thing I thought was Bing chat on the desktop. Is there a Bing chat client that I'm not aware of that runs on the desktop? And I'm like, do they mean like the thing that's built into Microsoft Edge or something? What does that mean? And so I looked at their blog post and I read it and I, you know, I, I, Googled this. I searched in the store. Is there like a Bing chat app that I didn't know about? There is not. 
What they're referring to is you're going to the web, which technically requires Edge, but you're on the website for Bing mm -hmm. and you're going to do a interaction with the Bing chatbot or whatever. And now there's a microphone icon in the little search box. That's literally all it means. It's just, you can talk to it, right? So you can do to it what you would do to Cortana and right. speak to it instead of just type in something. Now, that makes tons of sense. It's fine. You know, it was uh, inevitable. I, it's, an, it's, it, I, it's curious. It wasn't there already. I think that the co-pilot stuff all needs to have a microphone icon too, because I, I think that's one way you can interact with the computer. Yeah. Um, uh, typing long things is not necessarily a natural act for some people, but saying it out loud is possibly anyway. I just, I went over this blog post so many times. I didn't understand how they could call it. They, they referred to it as voice chat on desktop and it's like on desktop. Yeah. It's on the uh, web. It's, it's in the browser. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I just I got hung up on that. By the way, tomorrow's .NET Rocks uh, is with uh, Mark Miller, who's the guy, the chief architect for Code Rush, which is one of those oh. one of the the um, development accelerating tools, or productivity yeah. tools for mm -hmm. Studio. And he's been doing experiments with OpenAI, so he's now talking to Studio through his plugin oh, okay. to make code changes while he's also typing. Oh boy. Oh, it's but happening. that's Mark Miller was the kind of guy who did automations where he could outprogram you while using a pair of chopsticks on the keyboard, which was obnoxious. Nice. But he's that guy. Nice. I always so, tell that I, when I was a kid, I went to Casey Jones basketball camp. Casey Jones was the coach of the Boston Celtics, and so he brings Celtics players to the camp, which was always amazing. We met Larry Bird and Nate Archibald and awesome. lots of other players. So anyway, there was a there was a bench player, uh, uh, ML. What's God? I just forgot his name. ML. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm getting old anyway. There was a bench player for the Celtics who I, no one really thought too much of. And he was there. And they said, um, hey, he said, listen, who's the fastest kid in camp? And uh, we kind of went around a little bit, finally picked somebody. He said, all right, we we're going to race across the courts. We're inside the thing. So the two basketball courts. And uh, I'm going to dribble two basketballs. You're going to run. <laughs> and I can't, I can't think of his name. That's terrible. ML Carr. Bobby Kotick. Okay. He no. got back <laughs> to the f starting point before the fastest kid in camp hit the far end of the wall. Yeah. He was not and, even halfway done. And he was dribbling two basketballs. He's dribbling two basketballs, going as fast as and he can. That's and, what you just described for Cody. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a <laughs> different league, there. right? And it's just yeah. like, listen, the guy who does not, he's on the bench. He never gets yeah. up to play. Right. He's he was way most better than you for are. waving a towel when they were winning a championship <laughs> yeah. from the bench. And he's way better than you are. Oh, right? yes. Just yeah. be very oh, clear. Yes. Anyway, I'm sorry. You just you literally just described that exact scenario. Yeah, no. <laughs> Mark, Programming with mean, chopsticks is excellent. Yes. It's it's a it's hilarious to watch, but yeah. Uh, yeah, he's also been doing that shtick for a long, long time. Like he really good with the chopsticks. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't want to beat this one to death too too much, but uh, Microsoft Edge one fifteen has hit the beta channel. I keep looking at what I did it with one fourteen. I looked. I did it with one fifteen. When is this new visual refresh that Microsoft talked about at Build going to happen to Edge? And if you look at 115 in the beta channel, you'll see that it's about 50% of it. <laughs> and what I mean by that is they reorganize where things are in the toolbar area. The profiles goes over to the left side. It used to be on the right, that kind of thing. But what you don't get is the floating rounded tab tabs right, at the top. You actually have to enable that feature. So maybe it's going to be 116. It's going to be a while. It's kind of weird how long this is taking. But if the reason this is over four versions, you may actually have a seizure. Yeah, back in um, uh, April or maybe early May, I knowing that before build, it was before build, I knew this visual refresh was coming because they were testing it in the inside a program. And I thought, I'm going to start updating the chapters in the book so I have the new UI. I want to get on top of this. And I got halfway through. I, I updated over 100 screenshots and then my build happened. And uh, they showed off the UI. It was completely different. And I'm like, <laughs> what have you done to me? So for the past... Last week and then all of the weekend and then part of Monday, I finally went I, using the beta version, turned on all of the stuff. I updated all seven edge chapters. Every single screenshot has been updated. I've added some content to it. I'm guaranteed. I tell you, by the time this thing ships, it will be different again. And I'm going to, I just I yeah. buy a Mac and call it a day. <laughs> okay. And then finally, oh my. Um, <laughs> Bill Goodness Valdi nice. announced that they will masquerade as Edge so that its users can use Bing Chat in the browser. And I, I, I'm sure this generated some chuckles in certain corners, but I will just tell you, browsers masquerade as other browsers all the time. They have yeah. to. Like, that's how browsers work today, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, most browsers or most uh, websites are written to Chrome, you know, whatever, if you have special features. 
it, it kind of pays to pretend you're Chrome a lot of the time. Uh, being based on Chromium really helps, obviously. Uh, but this is not unique and honestly good for them. I, I Microsoft is going to add the ability to use Bing Chat from any browser at some point this year. That is in the plan. But if you want to do it now and you want to use your browser, well, if you want to use your browser, if it's Vivaldi, um, it works. I guess so. any Chromium... Uh, based browser could could do that right is it just yeah, the yeah. Uh, do you just say what the agent is they say the pretend the it's agent user is agent sorry user so they, agent? they have okay. a term for this yeah their their term is i believe it's i just want to make sure i get this right i think they call it user agent discrimination yeah that's, <laughs> that's what they call it. what so um it's impersonation just, yeah, it's is better than well it, what they're suffering from is the discrimination so now they're impersonated oh, i call it i, I call see. it cosplaying they're cosplaying cosplaying is perfect <laughs> you know it's like they dressed up in a little costume yeah, and they showed up yeah like, that's right you're like oh look at that uh, green like and blue icon I mean, come on in come you on want in. some coupons huh? <laughs> 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 that's cool good for good. them that's yeah. actually a reason to use vivaldi yeah <clears throat> at least Clever. instead of edge yeah, I mean, people have asked me about the I use, you know, Brave obviously, and I would say the difference between Brave and Vivaldi, they both actually have a pretty uh, similar kind of security posture. Like if you go to those you know, tracking sites, see how it's doing, it does a good job. Uh, well, assuming you turn on well, and when you set it up, turn it up to be good protection. Um, the big thing about Vivaldi is it's super customizable. Like to me, it's almost too customizable. Um, but some people are really into that, and they, oh, there's man, it an has enormous so many, amount of UI. You can have so yeah. much. All the, oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. So many knobs. It's so many yeah, knobs. There's like the sidebars on every side. There's like yeah. panels, and there's um, apps they have, and for mail and everything. I, it's crazy. But you know, some people love that stuff. So uh, you can tune Vivaldi to be just as secure as Brave, and then you can really screw with the UI if that's what you want. You can have the tabs on the bottom. It's not just top and side. It's like oh, it's crazy. bottom, top, yeah. left, right. That's actually why I don't use it because it's just too yeah. much tweaking. It's, it's a lot. But yeah. some people, you know. Some, some people, people want that. that. That's good. Yeah. It's a browser for all four seasons. Well, actually, in Vivaldi's case, it's all nine seasons. Oh, okay. Uh, they have a lot. It's, it's a lot. Extra seasons. <laughs> so, yeah, we have yeah. more seasons than the other guys. <laughs> that's right. All right, Microsoft 365 coming up. <clears throat> Xbox, yes, there's Xbox news and uh, AI news even. But first... A lot of big day. A big day. A word from our sponsor, Duo. I know you know the name Duo from Cisco. Duo protects against breaches with a leading access management suite. I've used Duo for years. Strong multi-layered defenses and innovative capabilities only allow legitimate users in, keep bad actors out, right? Authentication is kind of 90% of the game here. And for any organization that's concerned about being breached, you need protection fast. Duo is easy to install, easy to use. It quickly enables strong security. It does not get in the way of user productivity. In fact, I'd argue that it improves user productivity. And it prevents unauthorized access. And it does it actually in kind of a cool way. It's a, it's a multi-layered defense with very modern capabilities to thwart even the most sophisticated malicious access attempts. For instance, as the risk goes up, uh, your authentication requirements go up with it. So automatically. So, you know, if there's a threat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to protect you a little harder, right? I love that. Duo enables high productivity by only requiring authentication when you need it, which means you can have swift, easy access that's completely secure. Duo provides an all-in-one solution for strong MFA. Uh, of course, they do passwordless, single sign-on, trusted endpoint verification. Duo helps you implement zero trust principles by verifying users and their devices. Start your free trial and sign up today at cs.co slash twit. So you get it, Cisco? cs.co slash t-w-i-t. Secure user access without breaking the bank. That's Duo at cs.co slash twit. Duo. Uh, oh, pretty sneaky, sis. Sis, so. go get it. Isn't that? A, we were. I was talking about that with Steve Gibson. We said oh, that's a really good short URL. Cs.co. I love it. Uh, although you might say if you're going to make the dot the i, you could be c dot. C S C O, and then the A dot could be, but you know, let's not get crazy. Uh, 
I guess you you don't have an SCOTLD, so you can't. No choice. Uh, let's talk M365. What do you say? Yeah, I've got one uh, 365 story, one Surface story, one Dev story. <laughs> so okay, one of each. All into the same one. Um, there's been a couple of things over the past few years that we waited and waited and waited for. One with regards to Outlook, I should say. One is the that new Outlook version with the new UI and all that stuff. That's kind of slowly wending its way through the preview program. But the other was this thing called, you might remember, called Project Mocha. Project Mocha eventually turned into something called the calendar board view. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter because it's dead. <laughs> so Microsoft released it, I want to say, I bet a year ago, uh, finally. Um, it basically kind of a, a visual planner view, I guess. Uh, so you could have multiple calendars to do's and, you know, kind of, they didn't really call them widgets, but they should have, you know, it's kind of widgets and stuff. Uh, apparently nobody used it, so uh, they get rid of it. So that's what happens, I guess. So that's gone. Um, there was also <laughs> um, the Microsoft or Microsoft announced that its Microsoft Store, which is a an online store, is going to start selling components for Surface devices so that users can replace them themselves using free uh, free repair guides. That's good. Um, that's great. Yeah, the components vary by device as they would. Um, and it's kind of interesting that, and not maybe not surprising, that newer Surface devices offer many more components that you can replace, right? And this is part of the repairability story that has occurred over the past uh, few years thanks to lawsuits, right? Which is great. So if you have a Surface Pro 7, you can replace the kickstand. But if you have a Surface Pro 8, you can also replace the display, the solid state drive, and the SSD door. If you have a Surface Pro 9, you can also replace the battery, the USB-C, that's interesting. Uh, Surface Connect charging port, back cover, speaker, Wi-Fi modules, thermal module, camera front and rear, camera oh, deck, bravo. power play button. Yeah, Good for you, on Microsoft. On That's great. Yeah so, if, yeah, so if you go across the various product lines, you'll see similar lists where the older versions that are still supported, not so much. Newer version, lots and lots more. So that's Well, awesome. and when the older version is a seven, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's six versions before that. Yeah, that's well, that's true. But but I I, I don't uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember what even what was in a Surface Pro Seven. So Surface, I have to go back. So three, four. So that might be the last one that is supported in Windows. I I'm gonna I should just look it up. Why am I guessing? Yeah, yeah. Surface There's Pro technology 7. for this. I'm just trying to figure out the uh, yeah what the processor set would have been. So I'm gonna guess and say it was eleventh gen. gen. Was it really eleven? Yeah. Okay, so it's actually newer. Yeah, not that, you, not that you can get them anymore, but yeah, they're rel relatively new. Uh, it, it, I mean, we like repairability. Repairability is a good thing, and uh, you bet. they've gone that far. Yeah, and that's actually, you know, you mentioned in your article, Paul, that Apple's doing some of this, but this is nowhere near what Apple's doing. Apple makes you rent these hundred dollar kits, and you know, I mean, it, it, and send them back. I mean, it's much more complicated. You can't just open up a MacBook. So this is. I think it's a much more compelling story, frankly. Yeah, that's not Apple's style at all, right? Like their machines they're doing it kicking and perfect. screaming. They don't want to. They don't want you to go in there. Well, but plus they still have the stores. Like I'm kind of sad that my, Microsoft doesn't have their stores anymore because their stores were really kind of great. They were emulating the Apple stores. But the reality is that you should be able to just go to the like you can with an Apple store. You go to the store and they will take care of it for you. Like they, they that might be the that. that might be the real story is that Microsoft has to do this because they don't have a place you can easily everybody can go to mm -hmm, unlike mm -hmm. apple we i don't know if the storm hit paul's house it it might have been the hit. <laughs> <laughs> and i mean and his, and his and his next story is one i know intimately well too, why don't so you I do did. it do it then. <laughs> could just, just go I mean, ahead already, this is paul's writing and of course paul's writing is phenomenal but he's talking about um, the C Sharp developer experience in Visual Studio Code, or what, or, or what we know of as the C Sharp Dev Kit. So, I mean, it's kind of funny to think about, but Visual Studio Code is an is an editor with plugins, without you know, without a doubt, and it's really meant for anybody's use. It's it's very a, much focused on open source. That's the LSP standard, right? That's is that what they call it? LSP. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Because I, I know on Emacs, if I have an LSP engine, I can mm -hmm. use the uh, code plugins. So I, yeah, I have to look that up. But that's but, a, that's a I, standard. I, and it's an and it's the number one language server protocol. Yeah, yeah, and it's the number one editor according to Stack Overflow. Oh yeah, because everybody can use oh, it. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily great for .NET. 
I mean, you could do .NET development. And I've done .NET development with it, but I'm also a Visual Studio user. And so typically, if I'm going to do work in .NET, I live in my IDE. That's what I grew up on. Yeah, I've been using yeah. it for 20 plus years. Like, that's home for me. Um, but different cultures, different things. You know, there's lots of developers that have never had an IDE. Like, that's not a thing, especially in web dev. Like, you assemble your own toolkit. Your, your preferred editor, your preferred pipeline pieces, your preferred debugger, like that's kind of normal. The idea that an ID comes with all those things, sometimes with customizations, a very different mindset. So bringing in the C-sharp dev kit is really about making C-sharp productivity in studio code really, you know, powerful. Again, you know, like you said, the LSP hosts right. um, gives it all of the same sets of features. There is a... Uh, uh, some controversy around it as well, because there's, there's been some changes in Omnicode, the underlying piece for, uh, for Visual Studio Code. And the open source folks are, are generally screaming about this uh, in the sense of my, Microsoft's up to its old tricks, they're going to want to charge us for all this and so forth. Not that Microsoft has, just that the changes are, are upsetting people. And so there, there's a lot of questions as to you know, where this ultimately goes. We were talking, Paul, your, <clears throat> based on yeah, your story. Your on bit, the, Paul. Yeah, and, and, and I have to say, Richard did a very credible job. Did you yeah, lose power? I, I, yeah, I, we did, and it came right back on. Um, I wanted to hear what he I wanted to hear his... So, uh, sorry about that. Um, he made the excellent it. point that while he has for a long time been using a full-fledged IDE, Visual Studio Code, right. Visual Studio, rather. Visual Studio. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, like people on the on the Mac use Xcode, or people on mm -hmm. doing uh, Java development might use uh, IntelliJ or, or Eclipse. Um, sure. There are, is a whole. I think I agree. The whole generation of programmers who have grown up with a much lighter weight kind of right. VS Code, which looks kind of like a, just a text editor, but thanks to plugins and this LSP, this language server protocol, can really become a more full-fledged oh uh, IDE. Course. Yeah, I, I, there there is a much bigger audience for people that could use Visual Studio Code or another coding editor to, to whatever their job in development is than there is, I would say, for Visual Studio. Full, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, my but, counter argument to that is when you're a novice developer, mm -hmm. the prospect of assembling your dev environment is very daunting. And yeah. then every time you have a problem doing development, you're questioning, is this my lack of skill in development? Yeah, Did I, I misconfigure my yeah. environment? But it's also, so many it, more issues. It's a workload issue too, right? It, like, what are you doing? Like, what's mm -hmm. the, are you a web developer? Are you, you know, the, 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 uh, the interesting thing about, uh, you, it, there were already, uh, basic capabilities and extensions for Visual Studio code for C sharp. Um, and there are workloads for C sharp. You, can't do it in Visual Studio Code. You're not going to write a WPF app or a UWP app or whatever in Visual Studio Code. Um, but it's interesting, like this update um, adds a solution explorer type experience. The C Sharp Dev Kit, yeah. Uh, which is very interesting to me. Um, What's and that? I, I wonder if what does that do? It, so Solution Explorer is, the, it, when you have a Visual Studio project, the project's files are shown in the Solution Explorer. When you code in Visual Studio, you're often opening a folder and operating on whatever files are in that folder. You actually it's are your thinking project. about the yeah. structure. Yeah. Yeah, that's your project. It's got, it's just a slightly different way of thinking about it, but it's it's bringing this kind of classical .NET style to Visual Studio code, which I could mm -hmm. picture the guys in the full Visual Studio team going, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's not just, a so lot of people. It's not just them. It's the yeah. the it's the folk. There you know folks out in the field, the MVPs and, and people like that going. So um, right. is this it for Visual Studio? <laughs> you know? Well, I Visual mean, Studio feels very heavyweight for me. I, I use Emacs, that's right. right? But mm -hmm. Emacs really spiritually is a lot more like Visual Studio Visual code, Studio code. Than it yeah, is Visual sure. Studio. I, I yeah. use Visual. Studio Studio Code every single day. Yeah, I, I, like I it. use it to write, but I but for like I'm doing like web dev stuff right now. I'm learning JavaScript games and things like that. And uh, you do that in Visual Studio Code. You don't do that in Visual yeah. Studio. I mean, you I guess you could. Yeah, you, <laughs> but where I, where you'll be impressed with Studio, especially as an an experienced developer, is this idea of oh, we're going to keep our source code in in GitHub. That's this pop out over here. Boop boop, we're off. Right. Oh, you want to deploy it through Azure? We're not going to use GitHub Actions. Let's do a direct deploy to Azure. That's over here. Like all of those things are already there. 
The yeah. side effect, of course, is that the the IDE looks like the cockpit of a 747. Like there's so many knobs and dials and buttons it that is. it's overwhelming. I would just say so. Two things to GitHub. One, you can sign into Visual Studio Code with a GitHub mm -hmm. account. It's not just a Microsoft account. Interesting. Um, and the GitHub integrate to my mind, the the GitHub integration in Visual full Visual Studio studio to me is very complex i i have a hard time using it whereas it's just automatic in visual studio code i love the way it works there well, you're you're familiar with it the, yeah. the approach that they took in visual studio feels like tfs but yes. happens to be github there you go they right 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 the but previous again, um what do you call it? A code repository. Yeah. System but you got to think about what their audience is, right? Yeah. And their audience yeah. doesn't want stuff moved around. Like in a lot of respects, Studio has looked this way yeah. since the 2010 refresh. That's right. Like that's how long, and we're at 22 now. Like right, it's right. been more than a decade of essentially since the WPF came to it and they got that refresh, except for that brief moment in 2012 when all the Venues were all upper case <laughs> you know, for yeah. a screaming year, and then it went away again. Uh, and, uh -oh, I, and I think right. it's one of the problems that Studio has right. is that you have an entrenched incumbent user base okay. that is comfortable with the complexity because they grew up with it. And everybody new looks at it and goes, holy man, where do I start? Yeah, it's... It's a... It is a daunting application yeah. uh, if you don't know what you're doing, for sure. Even if you do, there's all kinds of weird things. Like, for example, uh, I'm just now that I'm thinking about it, weird little things. Like, I wanted to uh, get going with the Windows app SDK program. So you, you install all the workloads, you get in there, you're like, all right, so where are the projects, you know? Mm. And in the beginning, you actually had to install this separately as some kind of a, a NuGet package or something. And then eventually they added it, but it's an optional component. You actually have to go into the settings and, like, check two boxes. You have to check one that's in um, .NET and one that's in probably desktop or mobile, I can't remember, whatever it was. But then you get the project types and it's like, guys, like this is crazy. Yeah. But they're the, it's like, um, it's concrete, like the way they, they've set up these workloads and they're just not changing. Like they're it's, just stuck. It's very difficult to change. Yeah. I would argue, and I'm only going to say this because mm -hmm. I have no information that it's true whatsoever. Okay. That studio <laughs> is begging for a co-pilot. Ah. Because Copilot is actually an alternative user interface. Now, knowing you have an entrenched customer base that does not want you to mess with that GUI, that is right. utterly unapproachable by new people. Right. And if you simplified it for them, you would alienate your existing customers. Okay. Introduce a new user interface. And that interface is a conversational one where you say, I need to do X. Right. And the and the Copilot navigates the UX for you. You know. Yeah. By the way, one hundred percent. You're you're absolutely right. I'm I'm just looking this up now in Word, and I don't even think it's there anymore. Maybe you have to add this to Word at some point. The Office applications. I'm just trying to figure out if it's even here. I don't I don't even look at the Office UIs anymore. I don't really care. But well, anyway, at some point they added this. Like you could you could type in I want to do this thing up mm -hmm. at the top, and it would do it. In other words, like I want to italicize some text, and it would actually show you where in the UI. This thing was. This is in many ways conceptually like an early a lightweight copilot. Copilot, yeah, one hundred percent. You know, the Visual Studio is a giant Swiss Army knife with every blade and and tool out. Right, right. The idea that I could ask an interface, you know, just like dark mode, it's like, hey, I want to do mobile game development, and a bunch of blades started going flipping in, so that the ones that were important were more visible. Sure. And you could you know, effectively simplify the user interface, which you can always do. You can customize the snot out of the studio interface, but nobody dare do it because then you have to undo it. So the idea that we would have a smart interface that would do that for us, I think that's pretty compelling. Oh, boy. I, given how little of Visual Studio I use, if I could write WPF or whatever, mm -hmm. those kind of traditional Windows app workloads in code, I would do that in a heartbeat. Sure. Especially it, if it led you down the right path. Especially if it got you to the hello world implementation of a given stack. Well, I just mean oh. I already have apps. Like I want to go and update an app. I just want yeah. to load that project in. I want I got I wonder. I'm sure that Visual I'm not sure. Visual Studio must rely on text-based configuration files, not binary configuration files. But there's got to be something that describes. What if I, the what if I told you it was a it XML? Mix? 
Oh. That's a little bit of both. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that's the problem. There's your problem yeah. right there. So, well, you, you, it's a side effect of a 25 year old product. Well, really a 30 yep, year old yep. product, but let's what I was going to originally that. blurt out was I'm sure they use binary. Then I was like, wait a minute. No, there's no way it's got to be like XML or something, Yeah. but okay. So it's mixed. So that's the, that's the, we're never going to cross that gulf. That's not going to happen in code. Well, and there, and there lies the real question, which is, can you keep a piece of software that's been around this long in sufficient shape? Yeah. Um, to be usable by an expanding number of people. And I and I and I would have said no up until last fall. Until copilot. Oh, what until happened? Until copilot. Last like uh, okay. until the copilots. Okay. Right. When when that when all of this started coming down, it's like, holy man, this is a new user interface and it's one that is it's, compatible with the existing interface. That's pretty it's too much the, 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 you can you can see the corrections all over the place. Like there are all these little like toolkits that um, create like te they're basically templates for more complete application start points. So instead of get like a blank application, you get like a you can check out boxes and say, I want this thing to have a sidebar and a toolbar yeah. and an about box and blah, blah, blah. And it does this thing and it creates all these files. And it does it for you. And like that's I mean, that's just the way it should be. Yeah, like that's the, well, the and, it, and when you like were met back to you, are really going to want to listen to tomorrow's .NET Rocks episode. Mm -hmm. Like when you watch an, a very proficient studio operator <laughs> using studio, a number of times it's like, I don't care about the project you're working anymore. How did you make the app do? That? Like, how did you make my development environment twitch like that? Right, right. Like, you have so many shortcut keys, so many different approaches to do yeah. things that if when you know them, it looks magical to those that don't. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, okay. So I, I've got so if I if I could have picked a part of the show to miss, it would it, it would have been anything but this part. <laughs> this I really is the part you like, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I wanted to hear what Richard had to say about this because he's way more involved in this than I am. But well, and he, uh, like I said, I don't have a problem with them improving VS Code and opening the door to folks well, that are used to the VS Code environment now touching into .NET apps. Like this right. is clearly a tool that the .NET team want. But yeah, you're pressing against the well, studio space, and yeah. I want so, I'm interested what the story <laughs> the studio is. There's two things to this, right? Right. So one is you could you could almost feel the politics through the blog post that they made, <laughs> right? Like there's something going on back there. But there's also this notion that Visual Studio Code is open source. .NET is open source. Mm -hmm. Visual Studio is proprietary. All of yeah. those workloads are mostly mm -hmm. proprietary. Mm -hmm. Which what, what, I mean, which of these things? I, not that I'm going to guess though one, that one doesn't destroy the other. But despite what, the fact that Visual Studio Code is open source, that in order to use the C sharps extensions, you have to use the closed oh, source. Oh, Leo, that is a huge part of this story. <laughs> so, yeah. there, although actually, yeah. So there's some licensing issues. The issue is. It, by the way, it's not so C sharp technically is probably open source. Oh, right? sure. It's, 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 it's open. Yeah. That's not, yeah. So the issue is it, it, you as a developer need a license to create production code. So the way that this works is if you're a C sharp developer and you're just doing it for yourself, that's free. That's fine. You can use Visual Studio Community. But you get can you, Visual does Studio it work with Visual Studio Community? You get or, the Visual Studio or, or, Community license as part of this toolkit to use it in Visual Studio Code. That's how this works. Uh, but yeah, if but you're you still a have a license. Studio, it's still encumbered. Actually, yeah, that's right. Okay. And this is uh, this is a licensable moment. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Like this is this is kind of the. I think this is part of the politics. Like, how do we bring this thing that we charge people for essentially, right, through a full version of Visual Studio? Um, to a product that is yeah. by as, by nature or open source. I, I, if you use the Visual Studio Codium or OS Code, this isn't going to work. And that's well, the thing is the open source people go, well, that's the problem. It's not really an open source project. VS Code, you, it, to use well, all okay. of these but it's, listen, features. You, you use Linux enough to know that most Linux distributions you come up and one of the checkboxes proprietary boxes is, stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, yep. Do you want the proprietary stuff right. or do you want to go, you know, you get that option. So I, I think it's important to have that option. It would be better if this was just freely licensable, obviously. I'm not going to argue otherwise, but um, I kind of I made the <clears> argument <throat> a few years ago. Like, I don't understand why Microsoft charges for Visual Studio. I'll tell you, don't say that in front of people from Microsoft because there are right. reasons, and you, right. they will tell you what those reasons are. Yeah, Apple, well, gives theirs, it, Apple gives theirs it, away. It's a billion-plus annual <clears throat> revenue. Right? Yeah. You are talking about a non-trivial amount of money. Sure. Yeah. Non-trivial number of developers that build it. Yeah. Also, so, I just to, to Apple giving it away, I'll just say they do, but they require you to buy a Macintosh to use it. and. Mm -hmm. 
you, it only targets their platform. So right. yeah. I mean, you're sort of buying and you're paying for it. I mean, you know, you are paying for yeah, it. Yeah, a more um, subtle way. Whether you use it or not, yeah. <laughs> you know. And I, but I think the point really is that VS Code is intended as a gateway drug to Visual Studio. I, see, I don't know. I actually, I, yeah, I disagree. I, I don't think you don't think so. I oh, okay. don't, no, Honestly, I think, I think it's misnamed. Like, yeah, it's I nothing, agree. the two don't have anything to do yeah. with each other. Okay, it's okay. Microsoft Sublime. It really is just they saw there was another audience out there that yeah. was never going to use Visual Studio. And God <clears> bless them. Honestly, I, this is the one product Microsoft has made. Let me think about that. Yeah, that has been like not universally, but nearly universally embraced by the open source community. Mm -hmm. Like it's just recognized as being the best, the best. product of that. I, kind I of would things. argue this in the book. I will. I seem to have never been able to finish. TypeScript was an accidental success in open source. <laughs> You're right. Right. And and understand, but it was also the first time Microsoft had made something not aimed at its existing customer base, open source, and the right. broader community grabbed onto it. And everyone was a bit shocked. They, right. you know, Anders, who's not a big open source proponent, Anders is very, doesn't care. Right. He was very much of the mindset of, I'm going to help the Microsoft development base be more successful in JavaScript by introducing things that they're used to, like static typing and so forth. Right. But after that success, there was sort of this idea of, hey, when we do open source right, the open source community accepts it. Right. We should try. <laughs> yep. And that's what Visual Studio Code really was, was yeah. a first completely intentional attempt yeah. to build a good open source product. This is the ultimate, and if you, you know, it's one of those products that works so great across PCs. You sign in, you get all your extensions, all your settings. It works cross-platform in the same way. So you could sign in on a Mac, on a Linux box, doesn't matter. It's yeah. all there. It just works exactly the same way. It's, it really is, it's, it's such a great product. Uh, yeah, and, you uh, go read the comments on Tim Hewer's blog post mm -hmm. about C Sharp Dev Kit. Okay. <laughs> that's some rage. Now, okay, so that's the part I missed. So what was the, if you don't mind. Well, it's the rage about the licensing. The licensing. Oh, the, right. Yeah, that, okay, that was the thing. So that's what that's the thing I wanted to, that's what I wanted to hear from you was just, because it's just the reality of, it's where Microsoft is Microsoft, right? I mean, it's, we, we I guess I would just argue, I'm, at least you can do it. And for someone like me, uh, who is just a, you know, an enthusiast developer, really. I mean, it's just the ability to do that stuff in C, in C Sharp uh, with Visual Studio Code. Yes. Yeah. But I think that was the point. I think that was the spirit of it, right? Yep. So that's uh, what they and, wanted to do. But I would argue that all those other things are also true and potentially useful. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Let's Let's uh, let's do some AI then. Or yeah, something. this is also kind of all over the place. So there's a Wall Street Journal report um, that talked about the internal, and I guess I'll call it external, conflicts with between Microsoft and OpenAI about Microsoft putting out the Bing chatbot last February. And um, this is fascinating to me, <laughs> like fascinating. Because, of course, my initial confusion over what they did was like, why are they doing this right now? Because we went over this over many, many weeks. And uh, there were a lot of people inside Microsoft and also inside OpenAI who were asking the same question. Why are you doing this right now? You know, And um, I, uh, you know, we talked, Richard had that notion of 100 million users, uh, daily active users. Um, they achieved that with Bing. Now, to be clear, they didn't achieve 100 million daily, act, like new users. They got to 100 million daily active users. This report says that uh, open AI or uh, chat GPT vastly outstrips that is, is, uh, has now hit over 200 million and, um, daily active users. Why can't I That's find it? It's amazing. This? Yeah. And they don't expect Bing to ever catch up. I, and this kind of ties back to something I said originally about this stuff. It was like that goofy thing. I don't want to make fun of the guy, but the guy from the uh, New York times who said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm switching to Bing, you know? No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. And sure enough, a week later, he was like, it's calling me a criminal. It said that I was a bad person. You know, he's freaking out. It's like, yeah, because this thing's insane. What are you talking about? No one's switching to Bing. You know, and I think this is part of the problem, right? Like, the open AI has gotten a huge um, investment from Microsoft, as we know, $11 billion, right? But the Wall Street Journal calls their relationship influence without control. Uh, OpenAI is free to license this and uh, to anyone else and to partner with anyone else than they are. You know, it's forced them into a weird cooperation competition kind of a standpoint where they're actually going after some of the same customers. 
And Microsoft is, you know, this is leaked this like months ago. There was this thing where uh, Microsoft's marketing approach was to kind of poo poo open AI because they don't have all the stuff that we have. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, we want you to come over to us. So there's a lot of stuff going on here behind the scenes that you don't really, you know, all they're talking about, oh, we're great partners. We love those guys. And it's like, oh, God, I can't wait to get rid of these people. You know, like they're, they kind of, um, I, I think this is going to end badly. And I, and, I got to say, you know, uh, disruption, there are exceptions. We know Steve Jobs is a great version of this, but it doesn't come from the company that's dominating, you know, typically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not like Bing is dominating, but uh, it it doesn't come from the established. uh, Yeah, the the incumbent tends not to disrupt the market. Yeah. And I I just feel like at the end of the day, everyone's going to have these capabilities. Google will have it in Google search. I, I don't see much changing. But the thing that could change is open AI as its own thing. I guess we'll call it chat GPT or whatever, you know, like this, I, this has proven to be very popular. You know, mm-hmm. it's the type of thing. It's, continues. It's, I really question how many people signed up for the $20 a month. That yeah, would be that, the thing. Right. Like That's actually an interesting question. I mean, yeah. The let's, let's be the, and by the way, it's $13 billion, not 11. There was oh, a, 13, a, I'm sorry. an original billion dollar investment, which right. was 500 million in cash, 500 million in Azure credits. Like this was all about get those people over to Azure. Right, right. Then there was a couple of years later, there was another 2 billion, mostly Azure credits. I don't know how much of the 10 billion from earlier this year was there, but talking to Mark Racinovich and some of the other work that was going on in that space, like they built some of the largest supercomputers super in the world right. inside of Azure to build these models. They aren't portable, right? Like you're not moving this thing around. Well, but that's where, that's where Microsoft is going to be successful. Right. So in other words, I don't, it's like Bing's going to take over for Google search, but we could see a reverse of the Azure revenue growth slide Mm -hmm. because Azure is necessary for these open AI. Well, and I I think you hit the real point is why did we do this in February? Because we knew what the quarterlies were going to say about our rate of of cloud growth and we needed a new story. This is straight shareholder optimization games. Yeah. This is not necessarily benefiting the industry and so forth. This is how we keep the share price moving at a time when we're absolutely convinced right. because there's all these other markers that we're in for a bigger downturn, there's which also- I'm not convinced is true. But, you know, remember, <laughs> this was the quarter when all the PC makers are down 20 percent. So they're thinking, hey, we're a trailing indicator on this. A couple of quarters from now, it's going to be us. We better have a good story. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I am. And the other, you know, the other question that this uh, Wall Street Journal story sort of answers for me is the obvious one. Why did Microsoft just buy this company, right? Forget about Activision Blizzard. Yeah. Throw throw this money at OpenAI, right? And the reason is they can't. Yeah, I think Um, the charter prevents that, yeah. Well, but it's also an antitrust issue, right? Right. So apparently the funding they've provided is only 49%. Yeah, it's specifically in the... Yeah, charter of the that, company that they can't do that. Okay, that this well, is something they, they wanted to that the founders of OpenAI wanted they, to they guard were also, against. Uh, remember, they were like a nonprofit, you know, whatever. Yeah, well, then, they like, beca- then they became the capped profit. Which yeah, I, yeah. I went and looked that up. It looks like they made that yeah. one up. Like yeah, that's yeah. original. Yeah, right. But so. yeah, they, no, they're they're in an interesting position here. I don't think they can pull apart from each other, but they're not always agreeing. Right. Uh, if I was in Sam Altman's shoes, I presume I'm on the phone with Amazon already talking mm-hmm. about an implementation of at least GPT-3 running in, oh, in AWS. Interesting. Ah, right. At least. Now, the right. specs, I mean, I got a copy of the specs for the GPT-3 engine build. It was 285,000 CPUs, 10,000 GPUs. Yeah. That, and that's, you know, top tier, top 10 supercomputer specs. Right. But it, and now I don't know that GCP could even do it, but I'm sure Amazon could. And if I was in yeah. Altman's shoes, mm-hmm. having an alternative cloud uh, vendor really? wouldn't be a bad idea. I think he doesn't want to piss off Microsoft. I what's the well, difference? No, I wonder. They're in, they're in bed, yeah. right? Like that. Just because you're still in bed, it doesn't mean you don't at least prove options. This is the problem. That, well, problem. This is the design. It's non-exclusive, right? I mean, mm-hmm. both these companies have to have gone into this. Open well, and if Microsoft was wise, they wouldn't even discourage it because it helps with the antitrust problem, That's right? It. And it helps with. Uh, it, it also, uh, it, there's always going to be a good Azure story here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I this stuff is too important to rely on one cloud vendor. 
Mm-hmm. And really, there are only two cloud vendors that matter here. I mean, I guess you could throw Google in there, but no, you um, really can't. Not you when can't, you talk right? this scope. But this is the thing is, I that was the specs on GPT three. GPT four is seven to ten times larger, right? Which makes it the largest supercomputer that has ever been built effectively. Uh, even though it was, you know, temporary implementation, but the operating, you get me like we're coming off the peak of, of, of hyped expectation. And one of the things we're talking about is just how much the operating costs are for this. Right. Here's the real question you got to ask yourself. <laughs> when does the next 10 billion come? Yeah. How yeah. much RAM That's has right. open AI got? Cause Microsoft already owns 49%. Yep. Where's the next 10 billion come from? I wonder if it's not going to be direct, but will rather be in the form of Azure resources and credits and whatever. Well, that's what it's been anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think it has to kind of be right. Like, well, they don't need that much cash. Yeah. Right. Right. right, Of course. They really don't. They, this is what it's always been, but the, and herein lies the real issue is what do you, what can you even sell Amazon? Like why would Amazon give you 10 billion worth of compute, which I suspect is what you're going to need to do an implementation. Right. Like, how do you go about that? Unless you don't do it that way, Amazon's going to pay for it effectively. Like they, we're they've got themselves in an interesting corner here. Yep, and Amazon's been kind of quiet on AI. You know, uh, they they had that one developer announcement, but yep, uh, yeah, but they could. I they, mean, they all they have they, all they have to do is be Amazon, and they can be yeah. part of the story. You know, no, and I think they they're wise not to chase. It's not a bad time to sit back because we are headed down the Gartner trough now. This is a real good time to just pop some popcorn. <laughs> this is the um, the hype cycle. Like, when does it turn into 5G when we all finally realize? Wah, wah, wah. Exactly. But this is the normal thing, right? Like we went we went yeah. through we've gone through this with cloud. We've gone through this with every technology. Yeah. You know, this is just another one. We're on our way down. Like the peak is coming on. If you wanted to jump on the hype train, you missed it, right? Now we're we're down the roller coaster ride on the way down, and <laughs> jumping on now is dumb. Right? I, tweeted, I tweeted this today or yesterday, but I I need to see the the way you know that the hype cycle on AI is over is when the Onion publishes an article called "We Just Interviewed the One Guy Who Lost His Job Because of AI." <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you know it's coming. Yep. It's and like, what well, were you doing every day? And he's like, you know, honestly, I was kind of coasting. I, uh, <laughs> I think we're doing a lot. Well, there is a couple of lawyers who use Chappie GPT to write their summary that cited cases that didn't exist that look like they're going to get disbarred. Yes. So, you That's know, right. congrats for using software inappropriately. Yeah. I do like the idea of AI as a, uh, <laughs> it's like a lie detector, almost like a, um, it, but it detects it by lying itself. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a reverse lie detector. I love it. So weird. Anyway, I yeah. So this Wall Street Journal, if you can access it, it's I know it's a paywall, but that's mm-hmm. a, it's a good article. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this, this these two things happen on the same day. Uh, they're just kind of thematically related, but they're so different. I just it's astonishing. So Adobe and Microsoft both came up with uh, blog posts about you know making AI something that people can use and feel like it's kind of legally okay. Microsoft's s- solution to this, so to speak, is just ex- is exactly Microsoft. It's a lot of talk. We're going to get people together. We're going to form committees. We're going to do this. We're going to blah, blah, blah. We, we've been on this responsible AI journey since 2017. We're going to see what the, you know, what the regulators want. We're going to do this. There's no concrete anything in any of it. It goes on and on and on. And then Adobe's like, uh, we're going to have full ind- indemnification for the content created through our uh, generative AI. <laughs> That's it. We're just going to, we're just going to handle it. Yeah. If you make something with us, we will cover you legally. You're good. <laughs> That's exactly what you want to hear with this yeah. kind of thing. And well, and you know? I think it's because the other option is because you're paying monthly to Adobe anyway, for creative That's cloud right. to have access to this. So they were going to get nailed one way or the other. Like well, the reality also, is, yeah, God, I'm sorry. They've been, if they hadn't done this, Anybody who did get sued would say, well, I was using their tools. I pay for them every month. Right. They're in. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So you might as well do this because A, the people aren't going to use it and B, you were going to be there anyway. But they're also I'm, so and I'm that, saying they didn't do the right thing. This is kind of like the uh, to, to content is sort of what Copilot is or, uh, sort of in the sense that they have this giant library of content. They own it. It's licensable. You pay us, you get the license. Right. So we're going to build our models off of this content. You're good to go. 
Microsoft is using open AI stuff that's using what? The the internet? <laughs> so, you know, like where does this stuff come from? Like one of the fears I do have for uh, images in my case that are created with, uh, you know, chat GPT or Dolly rather or whatever is that I, I, ch I check every single, I do a Google reverse image source search, not just on the image, but on parts of the image, right? Cause I'm like, where did this come from? Like what, what, what made you get to here? I'm nervous that someone's going to down the road is going to come back and say, Hey, a little part of your image there. Uh, here's my original, you know? And uh, that's scary. Do and you ever so, come you know, up with hits? No, not even once. Yeah. No, not yet. No, nothing, nothing. I think they're pretty well mushed up. I hope so. Yeah. I'm kind of counting on it at this point. <laughs> but uh, I don't pay for like Adobe CC, but I, you, yeah, you could make a case. I mean, um, you know, that's. Mid journey is my I just, our, I just, our like, favorite. Microsoft's just like, you know, we're, like waving their hands and go and Amazon or uh, Adobe's like, yeah, we'll pay for it. Don't worry about yeah, it. We'll take care of it. That's how sure. That's how sure. It's on us. Fun. Microsoft's that guy in the bar. It's on us. It's buy a, around yeah. for the whole right. fam. Right. Uh, and then no big deal, but we know Microsoft's doing this in the Microsoft store, uh, Amazon predictably, and and obviously we'll use AI based review summaries on its site. I think this makes sense because most of those reviews are written by, by AI. Yeah, in the first place, so, uh, they might as well be reviewed by it. <laughs> we'll just collate them together and uh, here you go. So everything's like five stars, guys. Uh, this is a great product. You should definitely buy it. Um, that's how I mean, the work. real question is, are we going to market as this was written by AI yeah. and also approved by AI? Right. <laughs> right. Also created by AI, mm -hmm. as it turns out. Yeah, every step and, of the way. Yeah. And we already talked about Google and, and that stuff. So I got came in earlier. Yeah. I like that Google wants or uh, the EU wants to divest uh, Google of their ad empire. I think that's hilarious. I <laughs> That's a true pop card. Good luck. Good luck. Awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Is there any more proof that they don't understand? <laughs> the only problem with the EU is that uh, they move so slow. And mm -hmm. uh, by the time this thing is resolved, we won't even have ads anymore. This won't matter. So yeah, I don't know that I disagree with you. Like clearly the models, co you know, collapsing in on itself. Just yeah. ask Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah. Just ask me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not going well. But yeah. Okay. Now. Let's yes. Xbox it. All right. Well, we had our big Xbox story up front, but actually this story is almost as big, right? Because in a world in which Microsoft might not, and, and to some people's opinions, probably won't be able to acquire Activision Blizzard, what does the future look like, right? So they had this big event on Sunday. They showed off a bunch of new games, whatever, you know, game, 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 a lot of these game demos, you know, but then at the end they had this kind of little, talk with you know uh, you know guys i'm sorry i should say they announced some things uh pc game past titles are coming to nvidia geforce now this year uh starfield is going to be the big game of the future so there's a starfield controller you can buy you know there's a one terabyte xbox series s console but also no plans for an interim xbox console upgrade i'm like what is the one terabyte xbox series s i know it doesn't have better graphics or cpu but it does have the storage we need in today's world because these games are humongous and right now in my xbox series s which again i have not used since March 2nd, mm -hmm. I can fit like maybe three games on this thing. I mean, you need more space. So it's a good thing. It's all fine. But what, I what's the, like, what's going to happen? Like you, Microsoft just spent almost a year and a half crapping on Xbox and it did it to prove to regulators that this thing is not competitive in any way, shape and form, right? The idea here is you have to let us buy this thing because on the other side of it, we're still not going to be dominant. We, we can't compete in consoles. We literally are losing and have always been losing. And why can't you just let us do this thing? Well, now they're probably not going to get it or might not get it. And you just spent a year and a half almost telling everyone how bad Xbox is. So this event was kind of designed to reassure people, I guess. Right. And I got to tell you, I, 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 and I stand in contrast to some people I've talked to. I, I, not everyone agrees with this for sure, but I kind of look at the state of Xbox. They, they provided some more, Concrete numbers. I, I, when I talk about like um, quarterly revenues, you know, there's like hard numbers and soft numbers. Microsoft has invented a number in between those things, which is I don't know what we call the semi-hard number. I don't know, but they, there's there's all these you know new records for monthly active users and monthly active devices. Okay, Xbox games uh, past usage surged forty percent, forty six percent in the most recent quarter. Okay, uh, we already knew this one, but subscription revenues from Xbox reached nearly one billion dollars last quarter. 
blah, 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 whatever these things are. It's like, okay, okay. And I think the point of all this is we're doing great. Like, we'll be fine, you know? But it's like, will we be fine? And and when you kind of look <laughs> at some of their stuff, like some of the stuff they say, like they obviously have a lot riding on Starfield. This is going to be like the biggest thing in the world. This is the one example, by the way, of a game where Sony could point to something and say, hey, they're doing what we do all the time. But they this was a game that was going to be cross-platform, and now it's going to be all Xbox or all Microsoft, right? Uh, they took it. It was going to ship on the PlayStation. Now it is not. And now they're hoping that this thing will be what Sony has a bunch of, which is like an exclusive title that will be a big deal. Um, Microsoft has said they believe this will be the biggest Bethesda game ever released. Bethesda being part of the um, one of the, the biggest uh, studios they've already acquired. Mm -hmm. And but it's going to launch with uh, 30 frames per second on the Xbox Series X. Guys, <laughs> like the 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 point of this console, if I'm not mistaken, was 4K 60 frames a second. What's happening? Um, it's it kind of undercuts the, the console, you know. There's also this quote I, that I kind of pulled out. It said, every one of the Game Pass titles featured this year, meaning at the thing they just had the event, came from a creator that has previously released a game with Game Pass. And I guess the idea there is that these guys have had such a great success with Game Pass that they're doing it again. Or... Mm -hmm. Why are there no new developers targeting Game Pass? <laughs> you can uh -huh. only attack. You can you can only grab the guys that are already there. Like in other words, uh -huh. one of the goals with Game Pass was to extend the life of games. So you have some big blockbuster game, you put it out in the world, you sell it at retail, sixty or seventy bucks now, pop whatever it is, and then it kind of runs the course, and then it stops selling. And the, and the idea here is like, okay, okay, one of the things we can do. This is not the only strategy for Game Pass, but one of the things we can do is we can take these catalog titles and say, hey, throw it in the Game Pass. People will download it and play it, and you'll get some more money. You'll get money that it's like free money. It's like low hanging fruit. And um, you're telling me there are no, there are none of those guys left. Like you're only mm -hmm. getting guys that are already using, like already targeting Game Pass. Who are these people? You know. So that's uh, I don't know. So I, mean, I, I just wonder if this is an economic play. It's like the question yeah. is how much revenue do you allocate from Game Pass to that game? Right. Well, you're, yeah. You're taking so very direct revenue. Here's a question. Uh, and I actually, this is semi rhetorical because I don't know the answer to it. Mm -hmm. My, one of the big things that Microsoft promotes is this notion of day and date games. So, in other words, we Microsoft Studios will come up with a new game, whatever it is, like that Redfall piece of crap that came out a couple of weeks ago. Right. Redfall is something you can buy at, at retail. You can pl you can stream it through. Uh, I'm sorry. You can download it through Game Pass, or you can stream it through Xbox Cloud Gaming. Right. So it's a first party game. It's out every way you can get it. But are there a lot of third party games that do that, right? <laughs> like, can you, I mean, by the way, there could be. I'm not saying there aren't, but I think there aren't. <laughs> I, I might be saying there aren't. I actually, I don't know it to be a fact. If there are third party games that do that, they're minor. They're not like the big ones, right? Like, if Starfield was a game that was out in the world, it wasn't a Microsoft Studio game, would they have done that? Um, Activision Blizzard is not doing that. And then, mm -hmm. irregardless of the, acquisition play like no, they never did anything with game pass i mean so no a game, a game pass to me is kind of like where games go to die right like it's <laughs> it's my terrible it's, marketing by the way <laughs> but it's my you know microsoft's yeah. counter to steam yeah it's like hey we want to have recurring revenue on older titles people aren't going to buy these discounting yeah. is a pain in the butt you know it's right. an easy solution a monthly fee and we keep getting we just take games that fall below a revenue threshold and stick them in there and then advertise the fact if you're getting so more value like the, for yeah. your monthly fee yeah it's like the uh, you know netflix has the big blockbuster stuff but then there's a catalog of just crap yeah and there's well, it's not necessarily there. crap it's just old well, like it's, it's fallen off the slope no and netflix right? it is crap <laughs> yeah it, but but yes, okay, uh, fair enough. All right, so uh, you know, look, it's fair to say that Game Pass and games, uh, cloud gaming are other ways to game. It's fine. I, I think one of the great strengths of the Xbox platform is that you have all these different ways, and they kind of mm -hmm. meet you where you are and all this stuff, and that's great. But if Activision Blizzard falls through, here's what Microsoft doesn't have, a mobile play. And this At is all. the thing that is inexcusable because whatever's happening with Activision Blizzard this is something they absolutely should go on after gone after this is the this is the biggest part of the game gaming market in fact it's such a big part of the gaming market you could make a very logical argument that it is in a market all in in and of itself mm -hmm. <laughs> there they there's there are no part of it microsoft is hoping and betting that uh, regulators will, will force apple and google to open up game stores on their platforms and they want to have be part of that uh, Activision Blizzard would help fill out that catalog very nicely if it happens, but 
I really feel like they need to, if an, if this falls apart, they should earmark some huge chunk of that money to jumpstart a mobile games effort well, of some the kind. The thing that's right? interesting about mobile games is that they're generally not made by very large teams and that most popular yeah. mobile games are made by smaller groups right. of folks all over the world, by the way. And largely sure. the business model is relatively predatory, right? It's free to play, pay to win yep. type games. And they've got a ton of Skinner boxes in them to design for you to, to spend more money on them. Like, and, and so in some, you know, arguably the only way you get away with a business model that bad is to be a small enough firm running out of Russia that there's nobody can do anything about it or electronic right. arts. Like that's sort of <laughs> your choices. Right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft uh, could, I don't know that Microsoft could make money in the mobile game business. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Just because the predatory nature of mobile game revenue right. is not something well, a credible corporation could do. You're talking about the company that puts ads in their operating system. This is right in their wheelhouse. Yeah, but that's, this, be that's this because is, they're not charging the customer for that. We're just stealing the customer's right. information for it and wasting <laughs> their time. That's I feel different. Like these are complementary business models. That's yeah. As soon as um, you're, as soon as you're manipulating, it's, it's, you're effectively getting into the gambling <laughs> drinking business. You are now manipulating yes. people's psyche to yeah. collect cash. Right. And you, you know, you've already got problems with regulators. You right. want more? Yeah. No, I, I it's, I, I'm not saying they should have bought like Rovio, <laughs> you know, or no. anything like that. I but, mean that. But look but, at the flack that um, Electronic Arts got over FIFA in yeah. the EU, where they literally declared that game gambling. Right. Uh, and so the kids couldn't play it anymore in the EU. Jeez. Like, that's what you're talking about, because that is the business model of mobile games. Okay. I, well, what's left then, I guess, is my point. So if they don't do this, they are a distant number two in consoles, right? Yeah. Um, they are like they're part of the PC game market. I don't know how to uh, even categorize that. I mean, they're obviously big players, big studios that have very popular games, you know, Steam, uh, Epic, whatever. Um, okay, so I mean, they're part of it. They're there. I think I yeah. I like what they're doing. And, and you are talking market. billions of dollars. Admittedly, there mm -hmm. are other people making many more billions, but it's still billions of dollars. Yep. And then there's this nascent market for cloud gaming, which I may or may not be a thing. As long as, as soon as we can figure out how to get rid of the speed of light, it'll be great. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, <laughs> right. We'll be on Mars before we figure that one out. But yes, fair enough. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, it's a, it's a tough marketing thing uh, to be like, Hey, we're always going to be number two, you know, uh, I guess that we're, tough. We're, Avis made it a whole pitch. <laughs> right, like, okay. they, like there's a way yeah. that a number two with billions of dollars in the pocket and less flack is not that bad. Let the leaders take the arrows, right? Like it's I not think, the end of the world. I, the, for I think for Xbox to make sense for Microsoft, they need to actually get out of the console business. They can't do that now um, because consoles are where you lose money every time you sell something. Right. right. The model and, is always, and making a console only makes sense if you have. Uh, exclusive titles. They, right. So Microsoft... And I might point out that makers. Avis is now number three. So <laughs> it, it didn't work out that well for him in the long run. <laughs> okay. But but Microsoft, you know, every, uh, console makers cost reduce uh, their products over time. And Sony has been public, has been very successful. So Nintendo, I, I, I actually think Nintendo bucks this trend completely. I, I think Nintendo might make money on their consoles from day one. But whatever mm -hmm. the, the fact is there, they do make money. On yeah. consoles over time. But what's Microsoft? the key to Nintendo? Exclusive titles. That is the yes. key of Nintendo. So maybe you play that's Mario the, nowhere all right, else. So, uh, all right. So actually, you've made a compelling case that yeah. Microsoft's biggest failing with Xbox is their inability to ship exclusive titles at volume like Sony and Nintendo do mm -hmm. that people want. And I think that's fair. Yeah. And you were, and you're never going to, the people buy your console because they want to play your game. Which, by the way, does explain Activision Blizzard, right? Yes. <laughs> like once you, now, well, I'm no, sorry. No, the real reason Excuse to buy me, Activision does, Blizzard, it, yes. and they sorry, keep saying it it's the mobile play, yep. but it's not. It's, yeah. it's, it's World of times. Warcraft. And Call of Duty and yeah, yeah. well, they, they, um, and, and it's the and, recurring yeah. revenue. That's a multi-billion-dollar business. Yeah, it's not an exclusive though, right? That, in fact, Microsoft has gone to great lengths to explain that these things will not be exclusive. But you know what? That's no. fine. It's but what they will do to Blizzard, what they will do with yeah. World of Warcraft, is they'll move it into Azure. It's right. permanent recurring revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
All right. As long as you keep the game moving, right? What's the, yeah. the miracle of World of Warcraft is that people still play it. Hundreds yes. of yes. thousands of every, people still play you know, it. I, every time I look at that, I I, re, I believe in your miracle because I don't understand it. But <laughs> no. But you know, it's it's that's where my friends are. Uh, yeah, Barry the he, orc he, and uh, my, my he, friend, uh, you know, Afriel the elf. And, yeah, Jiminy the uh, hero yeah, dancer. He, yeah, yeah, exactly. I love hanging with him. Just, I, uh, so chaotic good beautiful. is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Spend a little time looking at all of these recurring revenue games. Def right. Defense of the Ancients 2, right? right? Like, they're so strange. And people <laughs> pay yeah, every People love month. Dota 2. Oh, they love it. Every oh, month. They love it. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. And that's, that thing's been around forever, too. Yeah. yeah. So you talk, and those are Azure workloads. Those could yeah. be Azure workloads. They may already be Azure workloads. So but the, really, the sneaky uh, strategy here is really, it really is all about Azure, right? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> like, why would you look anywhere else? Yeah, right. Right. And it, oh, by the way, all these mobile games need a cloud backend. Yeah. Every true. bit of it. Yeah. yeah that's true. Yeah, okay. All uh, right. And then just, just real quick um, Sony already has a uh, streaming component to play, what's it called? PlayStation Plus or PlayStation? No, I think it's PlayStation Plus, where you can stream older generation PlayStation games to a PS5 or a PC, actually, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but right now, you cannot stream PS5 uh, games. They are testing that now. Obviously, the plan is to bring that uh, more, you know, make it more broadly available. By the way, this might be running on Azure too. Speaking of Azure, remember, I think this was pre-pandemic, right before the pandemic. But uh, Sony and Microsoft partnered on some future game, you know, cloud gaming platform. This might be it. So uh, I don't, maybe they'll split it between uh, Azure and Amazon. Who knows? But um, they're going down that route. So soon it will be possible to stream and PS5 games. Having spent some time with the folks that run back in infrastructure like World of Warcraft and things like that, mm -hmm. you're not going to multi-host because the only pressure you oh. get from your management is to spend as little money as possible per user running <laughs> okay. the infrastructure. Okay, there you like, go. Absolutely yeah. pair it to the bone. So no one is talking about what the back end is to this thing, but... Then again, no one has ever come out and said, hey, remember that agreement we had three years ago now, whatever it was? I guess it yeah. was three years ago. But I would argue this. If if you're running a 24-hour-a-day game mm -hmm. with a hundred, several hundred thousand users distributed around the world, you're not going to pay a commercial cloud vendor to, for any of that equipment. You're going to run your own. You're already doing the hard part. You have 24-hour-a-day staffing. You can there afford you a knock. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is about controlling costs 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, the, only, the exception to this is when you are the cloud vendor. Right. right, which Sony has an insurance company, but I don't think they have a cloud. <laughs> no, <laughs> they bought Gaikai to do yeah. streaming. I don't know okay. if that yeah. infrastructure still exists. But yeah. I'm sure they're running their own infrastructure to some degree, and it's and finding out it's hard. Like that's not a trivial thing to do. And I know Blizzard Activision runs their own infrastructure because it's the most cost effective way to do it once you're at scale. But it could be an Azure workload. <laughs> I hope it is, because at the end of the day, uh, Microsoft may lose out in a lot. You know, and we talked about AI, we talked about gaming, mm -hmm. and this could be the fun way that Microsoft kind of wins too, right? Yep. I mean, they by just being the back end. Every time I look at any of these deals going on, I'm like, what does it do to Azure? And it's like yeah. it's it's fixed recurring revenue. I mean, sure. as long as you keep the content chain up, right? Like they botched the content chain up for Halo, and now you know where it's at. Yeah, when Sony yeah. bought Gaikai ten more than ten years ago, they got their cloud infrastructure. I don't yeah. know if they're still running it, but that's one of the main reasons they bought it. Interesting. Okay. They have a bunch of right. data centers. But the bat the battle for for World of Warcraft was against um, Final Fantasy. When Sony produced Final Fantasy as a as a massive multiplayer game, it pulled right. a lot of cut because similar style of game pulled a lot of customers across. Now, the funny part is that they actually botched the initial versions so badly that then when they decided to rebuild it, they actually invented an end of the world scenario sure. to destroy the world, yep. which in the new version of Final Fantasy they now refer to routinely as the you know the day the comets came and destroyed the whole world. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, it's all brilliant. And they, they do that kind of thing in uh, like Warzone type games or uh, yeah. uh, what do you call it? Uh, whatever those games are. There. But that uh, battle uh, back and games. forth and then, you know, World of Warcraft improved and tightened and consolidated with classic, you know, and brought back some users like 
There's a whole business there, a phenomenal one uh, for creative folks to keep telling stories, to keep people engaged that it's part of their lives. And it's worth billions of dollars. And by the way, totally healthy thing to do. Uh, Don't pay no attention to my three month video game ban. Just uh, (laughs) definitely spend your life in a video game. Oh, no. Are you? No. (laughs) Let's take a break and come back with the Xbox segment. Has Paul resumed Call of Duty? This is back, back of the book. Are the, back of the book. Are the Nazi zombies quivering in their jack boots? <laughs> the guilt free enemies of all time. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> it's all coming up next <laughs> as the Windows Weekly turns. But first, a word from our sponsor, Cashfly. This show is brought to you by Cashfly. Literally, <laughs> all of our shows are Cashfly is our content delivery network or CD. And we know, you should know, you probably do know, because you've experienced it, viewers don't hang around for videos that go buffering, buffering. How many seconds before you watch that before? Yeah, forget it. Have you ever abandoned a shopping cart because it's spinning and you're waiting and you just go, forget it. I don't want to buy that that bad. I have. We all have. Uh, gamers will leave bad reviews if uh, the latency is bad. You know, you go around a corner and somebody frags you because you didn't even see them because of the latency. And that's why you need Cashfly. Customers expect a faultless experience when engaging with content. Cashfly calls it QOE, quality of experience. And it has to be there anywhere, anytime, on any device. Cashfly's been doing this since 1999. And they have the track record for high-performing, ultra-reliable content delivery. They've been doing it for two decades. They pioneered the use of TCP Anycast. That was way back when, more than 20 years ago. It's an innovation CDNs are still building on, right? But they started it. Quality of experience, number one most important metric for you if you are serving content to a large and distributed audience on a global scale. And, And nobody does a better job of QOE than Cashfly. Your delivery stack can be your secret weapon. With Cashfly, you get ultra-low latency video streaming that delivers video. By the way, when I say ultra-low latency, I mean sub-one-second latency to as many or more, really, than a million concurrent viewers at a time. You'll get lightning-fast gaming that delivers downloads faster. And players get zero lag, zero glitches, zero outages. You get mobile content optimization for your website with automatic, simple image optimization so that your site will load fast on any size screen. It Cashfly is the only CDN built for throughput. That's It's all about speed, right? Delivering rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and 30% faster than other major CDNs. How do I know? Because we've been using Cashfly for more than 10 years. I know exactly why Cashfly will work for you. It works for us. 35 and 3,500 other clients in over 80 countries. And by the way, Cashfly is flexible billing. Flexible. So right now, you may not know exactly, or maybe you do, what the peaks and valleys will be, you know, and demand. Cashfly will work with you to figure out, to smooth that all out, instead of having this big bill one day and a nothing bill the next day, to smooth it all out. So you can get month-to-month billing as you need it and discounts once you understand what the traffic's going to be like. For fixed terms, You basically, you design your own contract when you switch to Cashfly. Cashfly. Scalability, reliability, unrivaled performance, and we know because we've been using them for more than a decade. Learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com. How many times have you heard me say it? Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Thank you, Cashfly. You ought to check it out. Cashfly dot com. Now to the B-O-B, B-O-T-B, the back of the book. Kicking it off with Paul Therat and his tip of the week. Paul? Xbox is having a humongous sale. Uh, they're, they are saying that you can get up to 80% off on select games. They say Xbox. It's also PC, by the way. Actually, you can get up to 100% off, <laughs> depending on one game, and then 90% off in some games. There's some good stuff in here. You definitely want to get, just go to the Xbox.com and check this out. Remember to sort by percent off high to low i guess that's technically the tip 
some, and then also you can show up to 200 uh, games per page and then just go through the list. It's, it's, you know, the Halo Master Chief collection is in here. The Metro games are all in here. The A lot of Batman games are in here. I tend to focus on, you know, Dead Island, the original version is in here. Lots and lots of stuff and some really, really good prices. So this is a good time to stock up because it's also cheap. Yeah, wow. Yeah. $10. to. And the Xbox 2 collection, or XCOM 2 collection. I had a great time playing XCOM back in the day. XCOM. Yeah. 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 I got to still have to go. I still need to go through this whole thing, but I'm definitely going to grab a couple of things. In there. It's Far Cry, a bunch of Far Cry games. Uh, some of the, There's a Far Cry Insanity bundle, which is Far Cry 3, 4, and 5, which is hmm. like 18 bucks. So a lot of these a are lot older. Are playing. A lot of these are yeah, older Bioshock. games. But the entire Bioshock collection. Oh, I loved uh, Bioshock. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Still good stuff too. That, Arkham, I'm, that the original Arkham Bioshock scared us not out of me. Yeah. I stopped yeah. playing it at night. Wasn't that a great, great game? Just frightening. Yeah. Underwater. That was one of the games I played all the way through. Yeah. That's an excellent game. Me too. Yeah. All three levels I played all yeah. the way through. Yeah. Uh, f- oh, look at this. This is good. Mass yeah, this is some good stuff. For four bucks. Good yeah. lord. Is it? I mean, why do they do this? I mean, it's not like they have to clear them out. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, I don't know. But, but they're making money out of nothing. Mm, yeah, that's all they're incremental they're sending you income. Bits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think, yeah, because people weren't just like browsing and looking for something to buy, and now you can get this. You know, it's, these are catalog games mostly, right? So you can get them for cheap. It's good. The ultimate edition of Assassin's Creed Odyssey for twenty four dollars. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, mm-hmm. there Odyssey were points where the, I just the I stopped, one. and that was the Greek one where I just oh, stopped Greek. playing the game and just so beautiful. The yeah, you just yeah. look around. Yeah, but you know, watching a lady, get, you, <clears> you know, leave her hut. Go make bread. For I know it's amazing. Right. And then, and then go. Like, what are you playing? You're like, I don't know. I'm just. Yeah. I'm yeah. just living in in ancient yeah, yeah. Greece. It's so. no. I agree. I, I stopped playing the game and just looked around. It was fun. Watch right. the world function. Yeah. You know, it's funny. The game was a distraction. There that from is. Living in ancient Greece. Good deal. Yeah. Assassin's Creed Odyssey Deluxe Edition, sixteen bucks. Mm-hmm. Odyssey, yeah. twenty-four bucks. Yeah. Origins, twenty bucks. So maybe that's the pyramid one. It's awesome. The Egyptian one. Yeah. Yeah. I like the Rome right. the Rome one. Wandered around Rome for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. That's uh that's one. What else you got? So Epic uh, Stardock has released the uh, is released Groupy 2. So this is sort of the their version of sets that feature Microsoft promised for Windows 10 and then reneged on. They never did that, um, did they? <laughs> they never did it. But it also improves on what sets was going to be. Remember the point of sets was you could have multiple tabs on an right. application window. This one, you can just combine apps into like a kind of a combo window has a bunch of different apps. You can save it or, you know, pin it to the taskbar. So every time you launch it, you get the full set of apps with all the tabs and all the different apps. And it's kind of a workspace idea, right? Like yeah. it's just, I have a workspace of all the things I need together and there you go. Yeah. So 10 bucks for people. Uh, There's a business version and it's included in Stardock Object Desktop if you're already paying for that. So so now Windows 10 and 11. Run as radio, Mr. Richard Campbell. Hey. hey. Um, this week's show, 884, uh, high availability in 2023 with Alan Hurt. So Alan and I go way, way back. I think the first time he's on the show was 20, 2009. And I bumped into SQL bits of all places because he's and he's always been the scaling guy. Like, how do we scale up SQL Server? How do we build clusters and maintain them properly? And so it was really fun to go back on that topic, but just living in the cloud because this whole conversation about, okay, we know how to do high availability premises, but in the cloud, it's easy, right? There's just a knob. You turn it up. And he's like, ha ha. Sure. Now let's go talk through the problems. And and so really working on how do we tune workloads properly to scale in the cloud. And part of that is just the mindset of people who do scaling. When you were when you were doing it on premises, you always provision for peak. So you're, you're, you buy enough equipment so that they, you have the resources for peak load. And if you take that workload and you shift it to the cloud, you're spending a lot of money provisioning stuff you're not actually using. The challenge of high availability and and scalability is really elasticity, being able to scale to what you need to use at the time. Uh, And that'll save you the money and get you the comparable results. That ended up being the bulk of the conversation. Nice. Richard, I have to tell you, my wife just 
came in to find it, figure out how long this was going to be. Mm. And I said, you know, it's like five, 10 minutes. And she said, is it whiskey o'clock yet? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it is right uh, now. international <laughs> bourbon day. So let's, uh, let's yes. get, let's get bourbon in. Yeah. In, uh, in honor of international bourbon day, I thought we'd go with one of my very favorite bourbons and a very, uh, cost-effective one, Maker's Mark. The, that's the one with the wax, right? That's the one yeah. with the wax from the very beginning. So um, Maker's Mark started in 1953 when Bill Samuels Jr. bought the Burks Distillery in Loretto, Kentucky. Uh, back in 53, took him a few years to get up into production. But from the very first bottle in 1958, they did red wax dip by hand on the bottle. Oh, it's not like some like, plastic thing on. <laughs> no, it's not industrialized in any way. Oh, as far cool. as I know, I yeah, took the cool. tour in 2011. And they were still dipping. Well, and dipping by hand, right? Wow. What was, right. I've toured a lot of distilleries. I think you know that. <laughs> uh, Have you? That's <laughs> oddly enough. Up. And the many, there's many distilleries where it's like, it's very much, you get to see the sausage being made. Yeah. It's vaguely gross in yeah. the end. Yeah. Um, and this was the opposite of that. I came out of the Maker's Mark tour liking Maker's Mark more. Nice. And part of it was, uh, A, we had a phenomenal tour guide. Uh, one of, he was actually one of the Maker's Mark ambassadors. He travels the world talking about about Mark and, and being involved in all those sorts of things. So I'm not a, a drunk. I'm guide. a Maker's Mark ambassador. Yeah, no. If when, you know, <laughs> they, I'm a professional. <laughs> right? I need to drink this stuff. <laughs> as, as he's physically thrown through a doorway. Yeah. So, I mean, I, we got to taste the wart, literally the the initial brewed beer at, at 8 9%. It's like taste this. And it was very rough beer like it's a it's a it's a grain it doesn't have any hops in it or so forth then uh they're distillate they they use an unusual mash bill most bourbon is primarily corn by law 51 percent or more and in the case of maker's mark it's 70 percent corn and then typically at least five percent barley sometimes a bit more and that's just to provide the amylase for you get rid of all the methanol so you don't make anyone blind a feature um, in the case of Maker's Mark, it's 14% barley, but that middle grain, the flavor grain for the vast majority of American bourbons is rye. But in the case of Maker's Mark, it's red winter wheat. So they use 16% red winter wheat in their mash bill. And it's one of the distinctive aspects of Mark is it's a, not that same level of spice. Now, uh, uh, it gives it that it, that's part of its character as well. And they do a double distillation, which is also not unusual. So they use a column still to take that initial ferment, that eight, nine percent wort, and they take it up in a in a 30 foot tall column. still. I think they, the time they had two of them, I think they have three of them now um, up to 60 percent alcohol, which is quite low. Most bourbons go higher than that. So that when they and say lower barrel entry proof, that's what they're talking about. Right. Well, actually, they go lower than that. Uh, but first they go up. So, again, part of my the tour experiments was literally he stuck a cup under the running uh, on, on, under the output from the column still. Wow. So we were able to sip the 60 percent, 60 percent alcohol, clear um, liquor. And then he took the excess and dumped it back into the still. I'm like, wait, you're going to contaminate. Oh, wait, it's alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> In I fact, we're adding be, a little flavor to the, yeah, uh, just, the brew. It off on the surface of the <laughs> just <laughs> fine. Um, but what I noticed when it came off the column still was kind of this oily, uh, very grain flavor because they don't distill it so high that it takes all the grain flavors out of it. The next step is to put it through a pot still. So first a column still takes the 60%, then a pot still raises it to 65. So it's not actually trying to distill very high, but what they are taking out is a lot of the sulfur compounds. Remember, this is the copper pot still, so there's a lot of reflux in it. And so the, the alcohol is evaporating, hitting the sides of the still and coming back down repeatedly. And so then when you taste what the white dog, the sort of raw whiskey at 65%, you see how much it's changed between from a column still to the pot still. So you get that feel of what the pot still really does to it. Now that lower barrel entry proof you saw on the front page of Maker's Mark is that after that process is finished, they then cut it with water down to 55% before they barrel it. Now, this isn't introducing anything new when it's 65%. Like, what is the other 35%? 
it's water. Oh. So you're putting a little more water in it to lower it down a bit to decrease the bite that it pulls from the wood. The higher the ABV going into the barrel, the more draw from the barrel you're going to get. Ah. And typical for American bourbons is they go in at 62.5%. Hmm. And that's why the Scots, when they're reusing American bourbon barrels, go in at 63.5%. Because they feel like certain flavors have already been taken from the barrel. So they go in at a lower number and then they have, I think they're up to over 40 barrel warehouses, but they are rack houses. So they stack their barrels one on uh, on top of each other in, in slates because they rotate them. The barrel houses go up as high as seven floors. And of course, oh, in Kentucky, where it's warmer and drier than Scotland, it can get very hot in the upper levels of these barrel houses. And so every barrel rotates over the duration, which is typically five and a half years of aging for a regular maker's mark, moves into different locations in the barrel house over time. That means they can't get to handle as many barrels. And each of those barrels, by the way, well filled, runs about 500 pounds. Yep. They move them so that they live in all the different levels over the duration of hmm. their aging. And hmm. it, it is part of the character of Maker's Mark is to be consistent like that. And now we understand Donkey Kong better, don't we? <laughs> you know, all That's that right. All that behavior happens <laughs> That's there. right. Yep. Yeah. After the five, five and a half years, and part of our tastings, they actually gave us a chance to taste like, here's what it tastes like at four years, here's what it tastes at five, here's what it takes at five and a half, here's what it tastes like at six and a half when it's been over barreled. Like, there's a reason why we take it at this time. Huh. That it's that it had what a, a very great tour. Specific place. That sounds that like was a really such interesting. Such a phenomenal tour. experience. Yeah. And when then, you went to um, Kentucky, did you, I assume you did a bunch of tours there? Like oh, we, one, yeah. So um, did you find the driving between these places to be problematic? Uh, so we are um, so far apart, right? We had volunteer drivers. So we basically, we basically <laughs> did two different regions. We did yeah. the, the Frankfurt region. And so that was the Sazerac distillery, which is Buffalo Trace and, mm -hmm. and uh, Pappy Van Winkle, Eagle Rare, Blanton's all right in there. That's mm -hmm. also roughly where Four Roses is. And uh, Woodford Reserve, they were they were all relatively close together. And then we went south to Bargetown, and that's where Loretta is, and Maker's Mark, and Heaven's Hills, Elijah Craig, uh, you know. And so we really did them in two groupings. Now, I mean, you always have the same problem, which is by the third distillery. Yep. <laughs> This yeah. is what we used to call a table five wine. How can you yeah. trust yourself? Yeah, we don't. I, know, I know nothing. You don't buy a bunch of that because you just don't know. I know nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a absolutely a problem. Uh, yeah. One more piece of the story, I would say, we're Maker's Mark. As we're wrapping up here, actually, there's two good stories I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, in twenty in 2013, in February 2013, Maker's Mark, like many whiskeys at the time was selling far more record numbers and they were running out of whiskey. You know, it takes a long time to make, it takes five and a half years to make up the whiskey. They didn't expect to sell that much that, that early on, and it was going to take five years to make up the difference. And so they put out a letter where they said, listen, we're running out of whiskey and we're not going to have enough for the year. And oh. so we've been testing a lower proof for flavor. And if we lower our ABV from 45, which is their normal ABV, to 42, that actually lets us stretch the whiskey for the rest of the year. We won't run short. And we just wanted to tell you, like, we, we've tested it. We've, we've done all these experiments. We, we're sure this is the, a great product. And so we just want to, we don't want to make any surprises. We're saying this is what we're planning on doing. The customers freaked out. I'm like, don't lower my ABV. Like, you're destroying the whiskey. It's like, okay, well, there's another way that we can stretch the whiskey for the rest of the year. And that's to raise the price 10%. So we'll do that instead. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then they sold out anyway. And, yeah. You know? No, they, they they did just fine. And they've kept it at 45% ever since. But I, I, I felt like a very new Coke moment. Yeah. Like doing it in the open like that and letting the customer decide on the solution, I thought was very very well played. That's great. Um, the other aspect of this, I think, is important is that Beam Suntory bought uh, Maker's Mark in 20, 2015. Like most major distilleries, they're being owned by more and more conglomerates, which also brings up the interesting point, which is that all used Maker's Mark barrels go to Lafroy. Lafroy, the in in Eiley, uh, the Lafroy Distillery. I call it Lafroy, but. 
Which they also own. Yeah. Yes. Which so, also yeah. own by Beam Suntory. Like yeah. it's, it's very the one simple. with the G at the yeah. end that you don't say. The, the G. The, the well, G I think is, it's, you have to like, regurgitate. The foy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's like, <laughs> it, <laughs> as in, the, the G foy. is for G, who put a cigarette in my whiskey, Mike. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, right. You can Baker's dip your you. own uh, ma souvenir maker's mark bottle at the oh, dipping station and, when you and go. The dipping station. And if you order it, and if you do it in it. advance, they'll even put your name on the bottle. I want to do I, that. I have that a bottle of maker's great. mark with my name on it. Um, there is an, mm. although there's many different kinds of maker's mark now, and that's largely an influence of, of Beam Suntory. Even before Beam Suntory, uh, makers wanted to innovate on whiskey and they were had been experimenting with French oak, but that's a violation of bourbon rules. Oh. And they found a workaround for their makers 46. And here's the solution. The rules say it has to be aged in American oak. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did is they've aged in American oak, but they hung 10 toasted <laughs> French oak yep. staves there. inside the barrel. Oh, clever. On a on a piece of call food them safe plastic Liberty oak, oak staves. Let's just get like this. that meets the letter, but not the spirit. Yeah. Hundred percent, <laughs> you're spirit totally correct. But they you know. they couldn't deny them <laughs> calling it bourbon because they had followed the rules. And forty six is an interesting. It's a more expensive version of the whiskey. It's at forty seven percent. So it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, listen, the Mark Classic is the one you want. It's thirty dollars. Yep, thirty dollars. It's, ev it's everywhere. Everyone yeah. can get this, and you can drink it neat. You can yep. drink it on ice. You can make a great old fashioned out of it, and yep. you're happy every step of the way. <laughs> this, this is what bourbon's about, <laughs> right? The most approachable bourbon you could possibly get, made in a very friendly way. <clears throat> Admittedly, now owned by a giant multinational, but that you know, what are we gonna do? Uh, You'll be happy drinking Maker's Mark. Tip one out uh, for Ivan Menezes, who was the CEO at Diageo, who passed away last week at the age of uh, 63. Oh, boy. Oh, he, that's pretty young. He very young. He had an ulcer and uh, was in complications and surgery for the yeah. ulcer that he oh. passed. But, of course, that's the company that owns Johnny Walker, uh, yeah. Guinness, Captain Morgan, and <clears throat> Smirnoff, well, and, and Tanqueray. And about 30 <clears throat> Scottish distilleries. Right? That is... Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah walk, you know, Walker's built from a dozens of different. Uh, yeah. Wait, wait, uh, wait, go Scottish back to that recipes. quote. Go back to that. It says, we are losing older drinkers by the bucket full. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously, uh, the sky is blue, water yeah, is wet, yeah. and older drinkers are dying. Yeah, <laughs> they're passing on. Uh, he was not an older <laughs> drinker, but uh, he was uh, for 10, at least 10 years, I think, the uh, CEO of Diageo. So. Uh, Evan Menezes, who uh, really put Johnny Walker back on the map yeah, uh, nice. after some bad years. Uh, happy uh, Bourbon Day. Now you have a reason to yeah. tip one back. I'm Def Lab. I Cheers. am absolutely using this as an excuse to midweek <laughs> drink. <laughs> yeah, I had a little taste yeah. of green spot last night after uh, we got the, uh, all the house photos squared away and that nice. stressor was over. It's like nice. time for a drink. But <clears throat> yeah, I'll go. Uh, I actually have a really great, um, rare uh, American bourbon stashed away. I think I'll have a taste of that today. I, uh, uh, as, as since you've been doing all this, I've really decided to give up drinking entirely. <laughs> so thank uh, you. Thank you for that. <laughs> you listen, as long as we're one kind of an influence, I think that's all we could ask for. I'll tip back some fine uh, Kentucky spring water, a little branch water. I strongly and, recommend and looking into kombucha. <laughs> I think it's a nice little kombucha. is good. Yep. Yeah. 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 I like the booch. Yeah, my, uh, I have a little bottle of Jep uh, Jephtha Creed, which is actually made with red corn. Oh, how and, neat. Uh, yeah. yeah, given to me by a friend of mine. And, <laughs> Does that affect uh, the color at all? It does, it's very red, This uh, the whiskey. Oh, okay. Quite good. Uh, that is it for this edition of Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat, Thorat.com. Get his a field guide to Windows 10 and 11, all in one volume there. And, of course, the new book, Windows Everywhere, mm -hmm. which is a really good tour through the history of uh, Windows via its programming languages. Uh, leanpub.com. And, of course, become a premium member at therot.com uh, to keep the presses rolling, as they say. Host of Run As Radio, Mr. Richard Tom uh, Richard Thomas. <laughs> good night, John Boy. Yeah. 
<laughs> good night, Mary Jane. <laughs> Richard Campbell. Something on good, your uh, cheek there. Oh, no, no. A good, a good Scotsman. A good mm. Scotsman, Richard Campbell. Run as radio and .NET rocks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you all thank for you. doing uh, the show with us today. A lot of fun. I'll just have you know that my wife just texted your wife and us and said, for some reason, Paul always wants to have whiskey on Wednesdays now. What is going on? <laughs> Tell her you're having Johnny Walker tonight, my friend. Oh, boy. That's true. Um, or, you know, Maker's Mark. That, that'd be pretty good, too. I'd take that. <laughs> I'll take that. It's funny. Um, we do Windows Weekly every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 1800 UTC. If you want to watch it live, you can. You know, we stream a lot of our shows as we're making them. Uh, so people want the, you know, like the most freshest possible version, unedited, unexpurgated, can uh, do that. Uh, Live.twit.tv is the URL. If you're watching live, chat live in our open to all chat room, irc.twit.tv. Uh, you can also, if you're a club member, visit us in the Discord. There's a Windows Weekly chat going on there, too. After the fact, on-demand ad-supported versions of the show available at twit.tv slash ww. There's a YouTube channel as well dedicated to Windows Weekly. And of course, the best way to get any of our shows, subscribe in your favorite podcast client. Then you don't have to think at all. You just, you know, it'll be there uh, of a Wednesday evening so you can listen at your leisure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Have a wonderful evening and uh, we'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.